integrity uh, <laughs> to this, uh, what I would call a, a, an abolishment, but keep keep going. It's an abomination. You are abomination. Right. Abomination. Guys, wow. Jesus. Did, Jesus. did any, Whoa, did any of you pass South, eighth man. grade grammar? Did any of you pass eighth grade grammar? Has anyone taken a phonics class here? <laughs> Do I need to call up the folks from Reading Rainbow? Jeez. <laughs> And thank you. Nice to be ni- ni- nice to see you guys. <laughs> and then also we have um, the cream to the coffee of the podcast. I'm gonna keep saying that. I don't care. Step the cream, the cream goes in the coffee, boys. The cream goes in the coffee. Just remember that. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and Jeremy, the legend. Asifo Sporting, the Maple Leafs, uh, Blue. Austin Matthews. Jeremy, Jeremy was going to get a, a real team's hockey jersey. Unfortunately, he couldn't find any. So he, went into, he went into the kitchen cupboard Who's and found a Who's rag. Who's your team? Listen, Who's listen. Your My team used to be the Toronto Maple Leafs until they lost that crushing season to – that crushing playoffs uh, uh, series to the Philadelphia Flyers. And then I stopped watching hockey. Well then, you're, well, then you're a traitor. I'm not a traitor, my friend. I'm a realist. I'm a realist in the sense that I know that the Toronto Maple Leafs will never win a Stanley Cup. Honestly, I, just, I honestly I don't know why I'm going so hard for the Maple Leafs. I just <laughs> I just like I just like the hockey team that's in Toronto. Yeah, exactly. You like to support the franchise based out of Toronto, filled yeah. with players not actually from Toronto. But be honest, you found you found the Maple Leafs jersey under the cupboard. Um, you guys were using it to clean dishes. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, people. Hola, como estas? Fantastico, yo so bueno. Man, I thought you were going to break into that song. Um, What was the oh, what was that guy's name? It was like Ken Jordan or something. Do you remember that a couple summers ago? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ken Jordan like, Jr., um, yeah. Okay. Oh, like almost asked. Nah, 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 nah. Yeah, right. Oh, like somebody else oh. has to sing it because. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. That one. Nah, 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 nah. No, 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 no. Oh. And then, do you remember how DJ Khaled came uh, out with a song called "I'm the One" the next summer with the exact same beat? Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out, man. Shout out to music. DJ man. Khaled's the worst. He did that also with that uh, Maria song. Where what? Remember Wild Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're. Can we really expect more from the man that tried to pour champagne underwater? Yo, it's a sample. Yo, it's a sample. <laughs> he tried. He tried to pour champagne underwater. I don't think we can that really funny. hold this man to a high intellectual standard. That is funny. Yo, his music is trash. I didn't say that. Oh, I did not say that. DJ Khaled, we love you. Uh, yeah, we the best, man. We the best. We the best. You know, early DJ Khaled though was awesome. Remember when he used to bring all the artists together? Raids, man. Oh yeah. my goodness. He's we, still. Remember we taking over? Oh my yes. goodness. Want to see the attitude? Man, I love. I love we taking over. I'm sorry. Yes, we taking over. Uh, make it rain. He's actually responsible for. I'm so hood. A lot all of. All I do is win. All I do is win. Like, come on, man. We're talking about some hits. They're black. Ah, you know it's a hit. You know it's a hit when you have to add the Arabian H in there. Yeah, is, man. Is DJ Khaled is DJ Khaled of uh, Arabian or whatever? I think he's Iraqi. If I'm not yeah, mistaken, yeah, I think he's Palestinian. Um, oh, yeah. But still, you know, Arabian. You know. Yeah, he's 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 from the Arab bloc. You know. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Eats yep. those eats those tasty grape leaves with uh with the rice inside. <laughs> a delicacy, a delicacy. What do you put in your head in your hands? You don't like grape leaves? I love grape leaves. Jeez. <laughs> Dave, come on, man. I... Steph, no, I, let me ask you a question. Why are you like? Yeah. like... <laughs> Why am I what? Why am I what? 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 Why are you it, like this? Like, <laughs> I, some say some say I was dropped on my head as a small child, but hilarious. People never really know. Okay, guys, we gotta keep this tight. We gotta keep this tight. Uh, yeah, we spent like eighty years like getting this ready, so we might as well. The, yeah, the preamble sure. is the show. The preamble is the show is here true. at the mic. Yeah. So wow. we're gonna we're gonna delve into a little bit of news here first, Mike. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let me actually pull up the document because I came in ill prepared. 
yes, we yes. all. Typical. Yeah. I was actually going to mention right off the top that, boys, you need to cover me because, like, I am tired. Um, I spent all night watching The Wire, so, like, I'm... You know. I've heard that's good. Hard yeah, work. it's flames. It's flames. Um, I've it's watched good. The Wire. It's still, in my opinion, and this doesn't have to be a show about TV shows, although if you do want to do that podcast, I'm definitely down because I've watched <laughs> way too many TV shows. Yeah, man. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure the listeners out there are getting sick of whatever they're watching. We could give some recommendations one of these days. Oh man, I've watched way too many TV shows. Like, and not even like good ones. Like really bad, like sitcoms. <laughs> like nobody watches. Like that's my stuff. That's my jam. Are, are you into any uh, so bad it's good uh, movies or television like The Room? I haven't. <laughs> I did watch that movie. <laughs> it was really good. I thought it was pretty good. The Room, did you? Yeah, I liked it. No, the movie. How could you not? Room, not the actual. Room. Oh, you I saw. The, you got to see the actual Room. It's yeah. um. Well, it speaks for itself. <laughs> there, there, there aren't really any adjectives I could ascribe to it. But does, does um technically like Borat count because it's technically like. Like, it's no. intended to be one of those movies, you know? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say... Uh, by so bad, it's good. I mean those movies that are... were They were put forward as a serious piece of art, intending to be taken seriously. But the enjoyment you get out of them is just laughing at what a train wreck the movie is. Borat uh, is... Yeah, Borat, I think, is more of like, you know... Intentionally funny. Yeah, it's satire through, you know, getting people's genuine reactions to, you know, the stereotype. Yeah. Borat's one of the best movies ever, I think. Uh, let's take it easy. I think. <laughs> hey man, I, I think I think the way that movie was able to, um, you know, expose the darker side of America for what it is was brilliant. But just my opinion. Okay. And all news? right. Yeah. So in terms of the news, um, so how about that for a tangent? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and. But in terms of the news, so in the music news, um, guys, believe it or not, um, Division, they released a new album a couple weeks back, and we forgot to talk about it last week, so that's on me. But they released a new album, Amuse in Her Feelings. Um, you know, I uh, finally got a chance to listen through it. You know, I'm, I'm not going to release my thoughts on it because we got to keep this trucking along. So, yeah, that's that's a thing. And in terms of lifestyle, can I just say news, this? Can I just say this? That uh, division party next door, um, and the weekend all make music for Toronto. Yes, yeah, yes. absolutely. For better or worse, they have captured like a Toronto sound. And mm. once you move outside of Toronto, you start seeing Influence. kind of just how Influence. that is. We'll, we'll yeah. Be- yeah, I was I was I was gonna say I don't I don't really know how much of a, a bubble we're in musically, but I wonder if the weekend is as much of a superstar outside of yes. Toronto as he is. Absolutely. Is he? Absolutely, the weekend is one of the biggest musicians in the world. But the like, thing is, is like early weekend phenomenal, was man. so Toronto. Like early yeah. weekend was like like really Toronto. Like that's that sound that was like yeah, that's that like. Now like, it's. Pretty poppy for me, but it, I mean, some it, people it, it, early, 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 early weekend. Yeah, like, I agree. I'm talking high for this. I'm talking like even crew love to an extent was. But was, even like I, I don't get me wrong. I like Party Next Door's last album. Um, so I, I can't hate too much, but it's just like it just promotes a certain kind of perspective. I'll just mm. say, that. and once you step back from it and just. And you start taking like actually just because these guys are saying nice forget it no no we're not getting this conversation <laughs> not on our sports podcast Moving but it's on. just like it, it it's all sorry i don't on. want to pretend to be the most enlightened person but just it's almost like these guys are using uh, I, I don't know i don't know it's a very particular kind of love or romance i i don't know they're being simps that's what you're trying to say <laughs> hey I got you. you said that i didn't say that i got you don't worry they're being that. simps and that's fine it's it, it, no it's actually not fine but whatever like <laughs> they make simp music it, it, i don't hey. know what to tell you they make simp music hey 
<laughs> Moving guys, on. Those guys can really sing, though. They're really good. They're really, really yeah. good. Yeah. Honestly, though, like, but like, uh -oh. maybe maybe there's that set music, but also you have a Toronto sound with guys like K to make conscious music, like, and that's a Toronto sound as well. Like, I think of that, like, um, Heaven Only Knows, you know, like, all that Wait, stuff. All that distinct is, is sound, like, like I'm music? talking beat-wise. Huh? Sorry? Yeah. Is, is Chaos still making music? I think so, yeah, but... I, 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 I think that's interesting that there actually is a, kind of a Toronto sound, like how there's an East Coast hip-hop sound and, like, uh, yeah. you know what I mean? But yeah, I, 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 mean, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Like, it's distinct. So Sonically, Toronto definitely has its own sound. Yeah. And then you get the rhythmic rappers who like kind of take from that like sonic sound, but just do the rhythmic stuff with it, like Beretti and. But anyway, sorry. Okay, so in lifestyle news, this is actually kind of one that like I think is kind of cool. So like the nurses, um, we've we've seen all those videos on Instagram, kind of people thanking nurses and the memes with the nurses, and I said. I one time said with my friends and a lot, a lot that um, you know, it's nice, you know, to give the nurses some some love via Instagram and via some tweets and, and you know thanking them publicly, but you know keep that same energy with their paychecks. Well, it looks like Doug Ford might have heard some of those pleas because he announced yesterday that the nurses are going to get a pretty hefty um, kind of pay raise. Uh, for the next four months. So $4 extra per hour for a lot of these nurses that are working in the ER um, and in long-term care facilities. And if they work 100 plus hours, they would get a $250 bonus at the end of the month. Um, it's a start, gentlemen. I thought it was kind of interesting to share that. Um, you know, it's not sports, but like I definitely like, you know, soft spot my heart for, for nurses everywhere. So want to kind of Gives that a little bit of shine, and you know, yeah. like as much as like I like last to rank on Doug, buck a beer, yeah. you know, but he's yeah, last, yeah. Last year, sorry, but last year, me and Michael went to the Toronto Raptors parade, and the amount of booze that Doug Ford received at the Raptors parade was like, dude, you would have thought he was a part of the NWO on my Monday Night Night. Exactly. Night. Was, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, and I think if that would, I think if that would happen today, the same parade, I think the uh, reaction would be a little bit different. Yeah, shout out, shout out to the nurses. I, I don't, I don't know exactly how far this raise will go as far as you know raising their standards of liver, living, but you know, in general, obviously, I think you'd have to have a, you know, cold heart to not support the idea of nurses getting a raise in these times and i think it's it's awesome you know this in the war and covid they're really the the front line that, that we have so um yeah not to get too political but i i have a funny story actually about doug ford and mma that's quick if you guys want to get into it please oh, yeah please. that's way more please. interesting so um i forget which muay thai event it's called but it's the the muay thai event that happens in woodbridge at the uh, the banquet hall on jane street you know what i'm talking oh about. Uh, cold wars yeah, I believe it might have been Cold Wars. Yeah, or it, for Cold if Wars. it wasn't Cold Wars, then it was the one that um that, that Twin Dragons puts on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was um, I'm I'm of the opinion that getting booed, you 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 should the first thing you should hope for is to get cheered for, right? Obviously, you want to get cheered for. The second thing, like if you get booed, okay, at least it's an emotional reaction. You you can feed off that energy. But if people are just kind of silent, there's like an awkward silence, silence and um, indifference. That's the worst you can get. So it was at one of these Muay Thai events, and there was like a halftime break in between. And unbeknownst to everyone, Doug Ford gets up. The promoter makes an announcement. He's like, "Hey, you know, we got a special guest." And he's it, it was before he became premier, right? And like he loves Muay Thai and he loves mixed martial arts and blah blah blah. And Doug Ford, and he comes up, silence. Right. Complete silence. <laughs> and Doug Ford. Hey, everybody. Everyone like like the fights out there. Crickets. Y you know, we're trying to get down taxes and Kathleen wins and well, nothing. Silence. And this this went on far longer than it should. Maybe like a it was like a it, it felt like an hour, but it was like, a you know, five minute speech just, you know with segments of pure crickets in between. And then after it, he just kind of awkwardly shuffled out of there and everyone pretended like it didn't happen. It was just, 
it was so bizarre. Like, no one booed, but it was just complete and total indifference. All right, so let's role play. I'm going to be Doug Ford. All right, you guys be the crowd. You guys be the crowd. All right. Hey, 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 guys. How you guys liking the fights? Cricket. All right, so, uh, you know, um, as you guys may or may not know, um, you know, we're definitely looking into helping you guys, the people, um, because the liberals are doing a bad job. Doesn't that sound good? <laughs> All right, so so Sorry. what we're looking to do is lower taxes. <laughs> I love the way he talks though, like that, like oh, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> dude, he, they, the Ford family. No disrespect, uh, they are beefsteak tomatoes, like Dana White. There's some people that are just red enough and angry enough to be beefsteak tomatoes, and round enough. You know what I mean? They're red, round, and angry. God bless Rob Ford, though, as he rests in peace. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, it's it's kind of apt. Like, it's, yeah. I remember he had that weight loss challenge. Okay, we're going way too deep. But <laughs> there's some big there's some big Matt UFC Toronto news you need right to get now. into before we start bashing on Rob Ford. So Toronto is specific. Man. Hey, he, Matt, us, okay. he put us on the map with his crack smoking. That's, okay. That is funny. It, that was, <laughs> to be, no, I remember in other the, cities, Noah, Noah of – like Toronto and Rob Ford for that whole crack smoke. Hey, didn't you I mean, guys have a crack smoking mayor? Like, I think when wait, I was no, on no, vacation. No. Um, who was, who was uh, DC? He blew up uh, before Drake, right? No, no, no. So no, Drake. He, he was kind of brought more like attention to Toronto than Drake, right? If you think about it, it was kind of like he Rob. Was on the Tonight Show. Drake. He was on the Tonight Show. So, um, yeah. guys, we I, I think I think we should get into this big new UFC news that happened though. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want to do 10 more minutes on Rob Ford. I mean, I do, but jeez. Oh, man. <laughs> Guys, the greatest. Okay. three Come cards on, within All a right, week coming up. I'll tell my Rob up. Ford story after. I'll tell my Rob Ford story after. Okay. okay. Story time segment at the end. Very right. cool crack, okay. I mean, nice. no, this is a question five. <laughs> Sorry, edit that out. Edit that out. Uh, <laughs> wait a minute. So what? David, it's okay. You can be vocal about your habit here. We're an accepting community. Um, exactly. Guys. Excuse me. Three UFC cards coming up within the span of a week. Three UFC cards. Do you hear about this? I did. Yes, I did. Mike, take us away. Take okay. us away, Mike. All right. So, um, in addition to May 9th, that UFC 249 card being moved from Las Vegas, because, of course, they couldn't have done it in Las Vegas, because, of course, they're still a stay-in-the-home order. Um, it got moved from Las Vegas to Florida, you know how convenient. It's also um, they're gonna really they're gonna have two other cards on May 13th and May 16th, also in Florida as well. All three events will be held in Jacksonville, and the May 9th card we already talked about is stacked. Um, Wait, good know. question. Yes. Who's the um, oh man, who is? No, dumb question. I was gonna ask. I was gonna ask who's their what's it called their quarterback, but forget it, forget it, forget it. Who's the quarterback of the UFC? David, get out oh, of here, Jacksonville. man. Jacksonville. Jacksonville. David. Yeah. David. <laughs> I believe it was the quarterback, the, of, the, the quarterback last... of the UFC is uh, Chuck Liddell. We all know that. Okay, Mike. <laughs> all right, moving on, moving on. Sorry. To answer guys. your question, but... to answer your question, I think it it's not Blake Bortles anymore. It's Gardner. Oh, I think it was Nick Foles or Nick Foles last year. Man, Blake Bortles would be. Would be the quarterback for Jacksonville. That sounds he like a sucks. Yes. Um, no, it was it was Nick Foles and then Gardner Minshew, and then Gardner Minshew took over the job for a little. Yeah. Bit. So. Shout out for. I love him. his beard. I love his beard. Okay. Anyway. Um. So, so yeah. The next Sorry, two bro. cards, Mike. You're done. Yeah. The next two cards. May 13th is going to feature the headliner of Glover Teixeira versus Anthony Smith. Good fight. Good fight. Great. Great. Excellent fight. Uh, May 16th is going to feature, um, guys. <laughs> Stefano, sorry. Did you just say excellent fight? Yeah. Okay. All right. Not, 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 not Michael. in terms of, not in terms of its title implications, but tell me how it's that's not going to be fun. It's a good fight. You tell I me like... how that's not going to be fun. Okay. I think Anthony Smith, I, you know what, like, who Crockhold, I think one of the indirect things he's done is poo-poo the name of Anthony Smith. Anthony Smith is legit talent. I'm oh, sorry. Sure. He's good. He's good. Yeah. Um, 
And and May 16th, that card is going to be headlined by Alistair Overeem, a.k.a. the guy who shut down Jarzinho Rosenstroke for about 24 minutes and 50 seconds um, versus Walt Harris, who, by the way, Walt Harris is a is a man that like, you know what, you can't help but root for, um, you Uh, know, just outside the octagon. Heartbreaking story about his daughter. Um, Heartbreaking story. Um, So, you know. That's going to be a fight that I'm going to be actually tuning in personally just because I would like to see. Like, I love Overeem. I really do. But I would love to see Walt Harris really bounce back. Um, yeah, man. And get and a couple. I Sorry, don't know if we're going to go into the cards in depth, are we? Or, um, well, really we only- haven't announced the cards for UFC for those 13th and 16th cards in full yet. But they did announce the full card for May 9th. Um which is something I want to get into. There are some changes as well. But, you know, just initial thoughts before I get into that. What are you guys thinking about this plan from the UFC so far? Uh, crazy, irresponsible. But if it's going to happen, then it's going to happen in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, Florida is full of swamp people. And um, who knows if they're, they'll even be able to be affected by coronavirus, to be quite honest with you. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure, as with all of you guys, I'm happy to see some great high-quality fights. I'm not looking forward to the fallouts. It seems like the UFC is taking the necessary precautions, but who knows? What do you guys think? I can almost guarantee that they're not taking the necessary precautions um, simply because the necessary precautions would be to not hold the event. Exactly. So any precautions from now on is just mitigating um, uh, what's already a pretty controversial decision we'll keep it at that um what's interesting is i i also saw i can't remember the fighter but there's been there was a usc fighter that was the first one to be uh confirmed for coronavirus obviously he's not going to be fighting on this card but it's interesting that the that news came out the same week that they pretty much finalized the card um it should be said though he he got it he he basically fought it unannounced and admitted to it weeks later um that was Lyman Good by the way. Yeah, so it's not like he got it like literally, you know, like no. this week or something like that, right? Um mm-hmm. I think those things matter when you are explaining this. Um like sorry, not you are like as in you. I'm just saying when people do explain this, I think saying that does matter. Like he fought it and then weeks later admitted that he had coronavirus. With that being said, it does add to this kind of what's the word i'm looking for it adds to this error that dana white is being irresponsible and is not putting the fighter's safety at the forefront when he makes cards like this yeah and Absolutely. just further on that just quickly on that i just want to say that it doesn't matter that he had it before or whether he had it now you know what i mean like it's almost like that means that if he had it before and didn't announce it until now somebody could have it now or in the future, and we wouldn't know about it until, like, a month later. So that really, like, it doesn't absolve the UFC or, like, change the argument that it's, It like, doesn't. No, yeah, it doesn't I absolve agree. it. But my point is, is that you do want to I, – I would like that to be out there so that we're not, like – I agree. You know, you know I just – I just think oh, it's important. I don't know why. I just, Look, well, okay. yeah. <laughs> well, well I, I, I agree completely, and I think, you know, I, I David's point is, is taken as well, like – Who's to say, you know, these are fighters that were willing to persist on and fight in circumstances, you know, that mm-hmm. were a little bit questionable, questionable, right? Who's to say that in search of a of a paycheck, someone might not have been had a little, you know, some flu symptoms and then will go on to fight. <laughs> um, maybe maybe there we really don't understand enough about the coronavirus to know. Is it still are you still able to contract it after um, it's you run are. its course? Yeah. Well, are you still a carrier at that point? We don't know. So, I but mean, that's the, that this is the messed up part of, about this coronavirus um, issue. Sorry, did I, did I freeze? I felt like I froze. OK, but my point is, is that this is the, the messed up part about this coronavirus issue is that. People are saying 14 days is the asymptomatic period, right? So, like, for 14 days, you're carrying this disease and giving it to people who can be vulnerable from this disease, giving it to people um, who are going to, whose lives depend on getting the next paycheck, giving it to people 
And and so when you know these stay at home orders are made, a lot of it, in my opinion, is not just because it's like it's deadly or it's contagious. A lot of it is because you don't even know if you're giving it to somebody. Yeah. Right. And it's deadly and it's contagious. And that's the problem. Right. Is and that's that, why like, social distancing is the the most effective and frankly the only solution that we have at this point. And yeah. I don't know who else feels extremely extremely emotionally conflicted in that they're both incredibly excited for these UFC fights and feel a bit of guilt for being incredibly excited for these UFC fights. Yeah, right. Um but yeah, like I think the the main issue for me when it comes to these fights is like Florida is probably the hotbed for this disease, right? Um for this illness. And the one place they, of course, it's one of the few places that are kind of opening up their their businesses. But, you know, the place that you go to is Florida. Right. And not to mention that it's it's one of the places that, you know, was opened up after an 18 million dollar donation. You know, and again, I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying it's an 18 million dollar donation that was put there. It just reeks of corruption to me. Um, and I think that can't be ignored, right? But that being said, if you ask me, will I watch? Yeah, I'm gonna watch. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. that whole it's that whole race to the bottom phenomenon that we see in the United States all the time. You know, who's willing to eat the most feces <laughs> in order to get these the the business these uh, multinational businesses to come within their borders? And it's not the first time we see this dynamic. So. Um, you know, playing out in the United States, but it is kind of shocking to see it playing out in the middle of this uh, this crisis, especially with something as risky as professional sports. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me throw the conversation. Sorry, go ahead. I mean, now we know at least that Dana White is not a liar. He did say that the UFC would be the first sport back, so there's a silver silver well, lining. I would say that Dana White is a liar, but maybe just not in this case. <laughs> I'm trying to shoot us some bail, man. Women, women will never find the UFC. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Cyborg will never be signed to the UFC, guys. Don't worry. Oh, That's he it. did say that. Yes, he huh. did. Yes, he did. I, yeah. He made another couple of bold claims. I can't remember. I think he said Josh Barnett will never fight in the UFC as well. Um, what well, what was it? There was one where he said he didn't necessarily lie about this one, but there was a comment he made about Gina Carano that like was kind of all the way messed up. Like, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, what did he say exactly? Anyway, the point that she is, looks like Vanderlei in a dress. No, no, not Cyborg, not Cyborg. Carano. Are you sure that was Gina Carano? He said that about. Um, no one should say that about Gina Carano because Gina Carano is a delight. Okay. To be honest, I think nobody should say that about anybody, but continue. <laughs> yes, but like, don't besmirch the good name of Gina Carano. Um, let's see. So when it comes to this card, the one thing I do want to focus on is kind of the actual in-sport implications of the card, and specifically as it relates to Tony Ferguson and the rest of the lightweight division. Because Tony Ferguson does have his work cut out for him when it comes to Justin Gaethje. Um, but you know, if you're a detractor of like kind of UFC's decisions, one of the things that a lot of people are kind of throwing ammunition to is how can you treat Tony Ferguson this way? Um, excuse me for a second. How can you treat, uh, Tony Ferguson this way? Um, he's a guy who is one of the best lightweights of all time, and he needs to cement his legacy against Habib Nurmagomedov and anything else will not do. And, you know, if if this fight kind of doesn't go the way, you know, Tony Ferguson, you know, that goes the way of Tony Ferguson in any way, as in he gets injured and has to sit out for a year or he outright loses or anything, it further delays that fight from happening and gives ammunition to Dana White to then book a rematch between him and Habib. That's kind of the theory I heard. I thought it was an interesting theory. What are your guys' takes on that? Um, I was going to say that I feel like while the UFC definitely is throwing him to the wolves, I think this is par for the course with Tony Ferguson, you know, 
I th- we've seen that Tony and Khabib <clears throat> matchup canceled plenty of times, and then Tony take very risky fights, albeit not as risky as this one, you know? Every fight that you take uh, is a potential risk when you're guaranteed a title shot. So the Cerrone fight, the Pettis fight, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the Barboza fight too. These were all fights that took place after the Tony and Khabib matchup was canceled, and he keeps winning them. So I think partially the the responsibility has to play, uh, be on Tony for being so ballsy <laughs> and being willing to just take uh, fight after fight after fight instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to – Count me out. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until Khabib's um, able to compete. I'm going to wait for September or October. Um, so I don't know. It, it's kind of a bad decision on the part of Tony Tony Ferguson. And I think, yeah, it, potentially the UFC is gambling and losing the biggest fight of all time as well. Oh, well, <clears throat> I think the Khabib versus Tony fight might be the biggest fight um, of all time from a competitive standpoint, but it's definitely not from a marketing standpoint. That is definitely still Khabib versus uh, Connor, which is kind of puts more weight towards like uh, Mike's uh, conspiracy theory. But my thing is that it, it's not really a conspiracy theory. We like have always known this is the lay of the land. You miss a fight, you fall out for any reason, then even if you're the champion, if you fall out for any reason, they're likely to throw somebody else, another two fighters in there and throw an interim title and have them fight for it. And if they, for any reason, they'll strip anybody, basically. So it's not surprising to me except that... Except if your name is Conor McGregor or John and Jones. Exactly. You, go, you know, fight Floyd Mayweather in a boxing match and have a baby and be alleged of doing a lot of dirty deeds while in your homeland of Ireland. Dirty but deeds done to cheap. It's, it's after it's, like well after like 700 days like okay that's an exaggeration but my point is is that like after a long time i, I yeah I, I agree with i oh, sorry I'm right, right they get a lot to come back and fight you. sorry no no i i uh, you cut out so i thought you were done my bad um no i was gonna say i i agree with that sentiment like it seems like the ufc is incredibly impatient with some titles where they want to keep the division moving at all cost you know you're not ready to defend okay let's get uh an inch let's slap an interim belt on it but with regards to conor mcgregor and i would add the heavyweight division as well the ufc is some somehow willing to middleweight you know, look about look at middleweight even middleweight until what about middleweight until Addison got a hold of it, um, they were throwing anybody in for interim. Um, interim exactly. Help, especially exactly. once Bisping got uh, let it go. Well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly my point, right? Like with most divisions, this is the way the UFC does business. You're not ready to defend interim title immediately, right? With the exception of if your name is Conor McGregor or you're fighting at heavyweight, which we haven't seen the heavyweight belt contested for in quite some time. And I don't know. I, I feel like it's almost in the interest to give the division a bit of space sometimes, right? Let the fans let the fans really crave that matchup, right? Sometimes sometimes there's a bit of an effect where if you have um, the title contested for too many times in a row, you lose that buildup, which makes for a really highly anticipated fight. For sure. Uh, just to throw out a terrible analogy, imagine or in like football or basketball or soccer even – every game was a cup final or was like, you know, like a Super Bowl or like was like the biggest game. That's every a great single, analogy. Every single time. Like eventually, like you're kind of taking the meaning out of like the smaller games that build up to that build, like that big event. So I I don't know. It's interesting that they've chosen to do another interim title after how, how, how hard was it to, like, unify the titles in the first place? You know what I mean? Like, like it takes years to unify titles a lot of the time. It could take, like, up to two years before we get a unified title. If, 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 anyway. I, I, I think I it's think kind of disrespectful. Very... Sorry. Jeremy, Thank sorry. You. I think it's kind of disrespectful to uh, Tony Ferguson to uh, put his title up like that because the point of a title is somebody has to earn the – uh, right to, you know, compete for it. So I do see, kind of see it as like uh, a little bit of disrespect that, like, oh, they're just throwing, they're just throwing him, uh, they're just putting his title up to just get taken like that for sure. Uh, Tony's is, not the current title holder. Yeah, Tony's is not. He, no, 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 but he's the interim. 
right? Well, no, he, that's the funny part. He actually is the interim. Too. No, but what was that belt? What was that belt that Khabib kicked when it was on the, the interim? It was the interim, inter- right there. The it's former already- interim that Tony got stripped of because of an injury because they thought he was going to be out for a year, but he turned out to only be out for like three months. But, you know, whatever. And like, let's not forget, an in interim he won because of an injury. Like, I mean, it's just like it's a circular, like a circular argument. Like, at a certain it's just point, so mess- okay. does the title champion mean anything or is it just like a, a marketing device? You know what I mean? Oh, I feel like the problem is. The problem is with this division, the lightweight division specifically, is is that you've got four guys, I would say, who if they were, you know, bigger or stronger or smaller in any way, could talent alone could be a champion in any other division. I think Justin Gaethje on Kamaru Usman's body could be the welterweight champion yesterday. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yesterday. Um, can I get got, into a philosophical point? Conor McGregor. Can I get into a philosophical Sorry. point? Can I just make a yeah. philosophical point? Um, I think part of the reason why, uh, and Stefano kind of said like this, I I just want to see good fights. Um, I think part of the problem with mixed martial arts is like it's not about who's good at mixed martial arts. It's more so about who's gonna beat up the other person. Like on that day, while it's like in other sports, it's like the Super Bowl is who is the best at football that year, who is the best at basketball that year, which is part of the reason why, like David's like every game can't be like a championship game. So I think that's just like uh, a problem with mixed martial arts, like as well, like like they're not they're not bigging up the part about who is the best at mixed martial arts, which is why I kind of, like, really have, like, just fallen in love with, uh, like, why, why, I have such a sharp chart, Valentina Shevchenko, like, oh, boo, because she's so good what at, what is your beef with, what, what is your beef with she's so, Valentina she's in a so make-believe, she, she's, she's in a make-believe so, division, there, I said it, wow. the, women, <laughs> one, the women's 125 pound division does not exist, Okay. <laughs> All right. It doesn't exist. Just, All right. Look, look, just look, around the room. Room. No, no, no. We're gonna hold on. Ha- we're gonna do this. We're gonna do this. T- no, no, hold on. I just want to interject. Yeah. I just want to interject on something Mike said. Okay, fine. Go on. Go on. Go. 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 No, right. I just, I just, I just love, I just love how she is so overrated. Good at. Wow. All right, guys. And it doesn't let's, exist let's, because let's, she's eviscerated everybody. Really? Do you think Jessica I is? Do you think Jessica I is a legitimate contender in any other division? No, that's not, but, the, that's point. not the point. That, that that's is not exactly the point. The point. We rank. And do you we know, rank honestly, no, honestly, no, no, no. Wait, we rank martial artists by the performances you. against other elite martial artists. And 135. Think, Jessica I could compete in 135. Don't do that. Don't do yeah. that. Really? She could compete at 135 at the top top and, of the division. So you think she'll beat uh, the Holly Holmes, the beat, Ronda Rousey, the Amanda Nunes of the world? I didn't say she okay. could beat him. I said she could compete. Okay, hold on a second. But in Valentina the other Shishenko, division, Jessica I is not Shishenko, the top Shishenko had two close matchups with Amanda Nunes. In fact, she's the only woman that I can confidently say, if you put her into a fight with Amanda Nunes, I would confidently say that she beats her. Like, here's here's the problem. Here's the problem with Valentina Shevchenko is, is that she's about 5'5", five, five, and for a long time fighting in the division that she was undersized in. And then, and so she goes on in her record to be in, in that division, by the way, to be Holly Holm, a former title holder, Juliana Pena, right? You know, so she's beating a uh, woman like Joanna Champion. Um, so it's like, it's not like she's beating bad fighters. Like, you know what I'm Pena saying? Pena is currently ranked number six in the very same division that we say she couldn't compete in. But sorry, go on, Michael. Wait, sorry, say yeah. that again. Who's ranked six? Pena, Juliana Pena is currently ranked number six in the bantamweight division. Juliana Pena is ranked six because she's been off uh, because of injuries for a long, long, long time. That's the reason why she's ranked sixth. FYI. Yeah, I just, I just think that Valtteri Shevchenko's problem is not necessarily, yeah, like the division, the 125 division is young, but like, and but like she's not like losing to bad fighters. Like her, she's not losing to anyone, loss- but she's. Being against fairly bad fighters. 
like, okay, so in her three losses, it's one loss to Liz Carmouche early in her career, right? And then two losses to Amanda Nunes. By the way, the second of those two losses, I thought she won that fight at UFC 15. Yeah. It was a it was a chintzy it was a chintzy loss in my opinion. So it's like she's not necessarily like it's not necessarily a case of like oh she's being tomato cans and when she faces someone legit she loses. No, it's just it's okay. kind of one of those weird things where it's like you're getting someone who's dominant and you don't really have that element of relativity. There's no one who you can say okay this person in relation to the rest of the division the rest of MMA is relative and good talent to her, right? Can, can I, can I qualify DJ my problem. hate? Yeah, can, can I qualify my hate? Because I think, not hate, hate's a no. strong word. I, can, <laughs> no. qualify. I think I think she's a very talented martial artist. I think she's in, her style is incredibly risk-averse and often boring. And I think that she generally gets her finishes against a lower level of competition. Now, fair. Those are all being, fair points. That being said... I'm not saying that she necessarily is overrated as a martial artist. I feel like her accolades are extremely overrated. And that's through no no fault of her own. Because I'm not exa- exactly... That's my point, uh, though. But that's my point, though, is that I rate her as a martial artist. Yeah. Sure, fair that's enough. But can, Mixed martial arts. I don't know how we got on Valentina, but I just... Because, I, no, I'm kind of curious... Saying, I, I just wanted to bring bring it back to lightweight for for a second because I wanted to address something Mike said before about about the lightweight division. I would expand that. I would expand that list. I think, you know, if we're playing hypothetical, you know, whatever, <laughs> not I wouldn't say matchmaker, but if we're playing, you know, if we're playing God here and we can shrink or you know, expand any fighter to any division, I think the top ten of lightweight could be potential champions or at least the top top six you know Pori is a potential champion in another yeah. division. um right. i think edson barbosa could easily be a potential champion um charles Oliveira not even scratching the top five right so you know um edson barbosa, the only thing that's stopping him is his mentality this is exactly quite, quite so I've lightweight said that. Like, lightweight is a log jam of talent at the best of times, but throw in the whole situation with Conor McGregor and, you know, here we are. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I think we got into Shevchenko through like Jeremy's point because he was talking about kind of like the buildup of the fights and uh, how um, in mixed martial arts you can only really go for those big events. So I don't know. I, I get why they're doing the um, Tony versus um, Justin Gaethje fight. I just think, first of all, if Tony, it, it's kind of like I understand why people are saying it's a controversial or a risky fight for Tony. Mm-hmm. But first of all, I don't think Tony cares about risk. <laughs> and, so, that, and that's his problem. To yeah, be honest. But that's also to his benefit, too, um, because it, it's just going to be one of those fights. It's going to be all it's kind of like the BMF fight, if you think about it, in that you get two guys who don't care, are going to throw everything to the wall and just go out there and swing. But in a different way in that I expect this to be a little bit more competitive, if I'm being very honest. Um, yes. Anyway, but my point with that is that um, oh, God, I've written it down. But basically, yeah, no, it's it, it's kind of like a win-win scenario. If he if Tony loses, I generally think that yeah, Justin might get the next title shot, or maybe even Connor might get the next ch- title shot. But he's really only like one or two wins away from another title shot, so he's not the. And I know he's you know the wrong side of thirty. <laughs> or wrong side of 35, I should say. 30, yeah, so, 36, 36. Yeah, exactly. So he's not getting any younger. But but I do think that um he still like he still can compete. No, he still can win um can compete for a title again, even if he uh, loses this fight. If he wins this fight, well, he just took out one of his major competitions um for the title, and everyone considers him you know a badass for beating pretty much the toughest dude that no one in the division wants to fight. Um, so, 
Potentially, yeah. I see I see him and Tony uh, Ferguson in the scenario that he's in right now, and David kind of hit on it a bit, as um, one of these unsung heroes of mixed martial arts that did it all without a belt, cleaned out a division like a Max Holloway. Who remembers Max Holloway's run to get to Jose Aldo? He cleaned out the entire 145-pound division, basically, until Alexander Volkanovsky came along. I kind of see Tony Ferguson, um, you know, a, a, a little bit like that. And while for sure, you know, maybe he's taking on a challenger that he would have had to um, take down further down the lo- down the uh, road if he does get the, uh, get the belt against Justin Gaethje. Um, at the same time, optics are everything when um, when it comes to legacy, right? And I think it makes a big difference whether Tony Ferguson loses now or Tony Ferguson loses further down down the line once he's once or if he's able to secure that belt and one loss can do a lot to derail an entire career think about hen and Burrell, right so oh my god that's yeah that's the whole story. i keep that's having the- nightmares of um the podcast where i confuse hen and Burrell for Renato moicano i just keep having like nightmares of flashbacks to that moment <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah no i do agree that uh one loss can derail an entire career but also i mean We've seen it so many times that these guys yo-yo between like wins and losses, and I, I think like the in terms of legacy, I, I think the bigger legacy play definitely for me is gonna be Khabib. Like he's the one with the undefeated record. This is pretty much his final, other than like a rematch with Connor. Like I don't think anybody's interested in seeing any other Khabib fights. Like if he were to retire after the next two fights, I think we'd all be like, okay, thank you for a great career. But for Tony, I just don't think his story is done. For some reason, I think he's somebody who's going to be fighting deep into his 40s. Um, So he could still have, like, another one or two runs, in my opinion, anyway. Given his fighting style, I hope that not to be the case. He's one of those talents where I'd like to see him get another couple of wins and then hang up the gloves, you know? Like, you're done after Habib. Like, this is the problem. I think that's the problem for both of them, to be honest. Like... You know, like what more can Tony do? You know, like if if we're saying Tony's what number six on the all time greats list, like six, number seven, other than being Habib, and maybe GSP Wait. if GSP wants it. Uh, sorry. Of lightweight, number six lightweight. Of no, no, time? number six of the all time, like all time greatest fighters. No. Number no. Six, I'd, I'd have to I'd have to sit down and take a look at the yeah. the list of fighters who are in contention before I make that call. And I think it's it's hard to really it's assess. <laughs> yeah, until <laughs> until somebody's career is done, it's really hard to assess. I know it's where guys, they, you I know, know what I mean. Really, but like, who's okay? So you got Anderson, you got GSP, you have got John Jones. Not in order. I'm just saying, like in terms of guys that I would put ahead of them. You got Anderson, GSP, John Jones, Fedor. Who DJ. else is there? Huh? DJ. DJ, DJ Mike, okay, DJ. Even Sahuda right? would say, like, okay, maybe not Sahuda. That's well, you're, you're, yeah, you, that, there's exactly my period. yeah, exactly. there's there's exactly okay. my point because Sahuda you could put on that list, but I just I feel uncomfortable doing it so soon. You know what I mean? It's like it's the DJ course, effect. It's not a couple no, of, so, like, for Tony. It's like what more can he do to put himself higher on the list? Like who who finishes more, career? It's, it's probably you know it's probably Habib, be Habib. and GSP, if GSP wants that fight, but even then, it's like, really? Like, that's so far-fetched. So it's like, the only fight for Tony to increase his legacy is Habib. And well, this Justin fight. That's, Justin, that's, the, that's the thing. That with the Justin fight, there's no potential upside to his legacy, right? If yeah, he were to retire... From number if, six to number five. That's my whole point. Well, if, if you... From, I think if he were to retire without having the the Justin Gaethje fight, nobody would be scratching their heads and saying, you know, what would we never? It's too bad we never got to see the Justin Gaethje fight because then we would have known if Tony was one of the best of all time. And I'm not saying that because Justin Gaethje is not a great talent. I'm just optics guys, you know. But the Khabib fight really is one of those fights that, like, if Tony were to win or lose that fight, you know, I think he could call it a career and there'd be no questions as to his status in the pound for pound, wherever that may be. I just don't think he's going to do that. I think he's, he's missed a lot of time. Like the last five, six, seven years, like how many fights has he had? It's not like he's been fighting like three or four fights every year. Like he's had maybe one fight a year. I remember those one time was out for like two years. Like, so he's still like relatively fresh in terms of 
well, for a 36-year-old in terms of... Uh, and he has taken a lot of beating, but I, I still think, like, he... I don't know. He's still got another run in him. But Look, I, I agree. I, There's not really a lot of people for him to fight, but then you never know who's going to pop up from either the division below or even from lower in the rankings. Um, yeah, that that's, that's the thing you really never know because up until... And here's why I feel uncomfortable making these sorts of predictions. Max Holloway, we go back a year or two and we're talking about how he's one of the best pound for pound of all time and he's cleaned out a division and there's no one left and then all of a sudden someone named Alexander Volkanovsky comes knocking, right? Like a freight train. Like and a that's the problem. Train. And that's a pro- well. And then once again, just to we can wrap this up too, especially because Jeremy hasn't said anything in like fifteen minutes. What are you talking about? I said it's funny. <laughs> I, 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 I have something I wanted to ask you guys after this. Okay. Um. But I, I just said, I, and I just want to say I agree with Stefano that when somebody's still fighting, it's really tough to kind of uh, understand where their career ranks up uh, against like the all-time great. Because once again, as you said, Max Holloway. Just because he lost to Alex Volkanovski, who is on a hell of a run, like he's Bro not city. lost. Like, that city gym, man. That city man. gym is coming. He's killing it. <laughs> yeah. They're but, coming. And, okay, yeah, and then exactly. he lost to Dustin Poirier as well. Like we can't agree that he also lost to Dustin Poirier. But bef- but between that, like his run is as good as anybody. But, and that's like, the thing. He, he did it without on- a title. He did it without a title. But he doesn't get put on the all-time list. You know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. Exactly, because he did it without a title. My, exactly yeah. my point. Yeah. But he and got I'm, the title and was dominating still. And Oh, for sure. But if for a while, he was in a position where it's like, who's going to be my next challenger? I've beaten you all with no, you know, with no praise from the, from the masses because it wasn't in a main event slot, right? And it wasn't for a title, right? And so, like, the problem with Tony that Tony's having is that he's, he's in that range where it's like, unless it's Habib and for a title... What's going to optically put him in in the conversation? What yeah. else is going to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, Connor's not going to do it. You, Dustin Poirier, ha, huh? what, what are you talking about here? Like, I, I think I, beating I, Connor would do it. And I, I, I think I think not from us hardcores who understand, uh, you know what I mean? The, the kind of uh, challenges that Tony's already to, uh, had to overcome. It wouldn't do anything necessarily to convince us, but it would certainly put him on the the conversation with the uh, the normies. For sure. I, maybe I guess. I think it would add to his legacy. I, I don't see how it, it wouldn't. Like I, yeah. If, if beating Cerrone the first time added to Ferguson's legacy, I don't see why beating Conor McGregor wouldn't add to his legacy. You know what? I mean? You know what? It didn't do it for me. That that Cerrone fight didn't really do it for me. The only reason why there was in doubt is because Cerrone was going on a run where he was just starching people. Remember, he starched Al- Hernandez, then he starched Ally Quinta after Al- Ally Quinta beat Kevin Lee, who everyone thought was going to get the title shot after that win. So it's like. Shout out Kevin Lee, man. Oh, man. All right. We're going on a hell of a tangent here. Yeah. I, 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 do you mind if I take a bit of a diversion and I ask you guys something? Sure. Because the, Jeremy's Valentina, uh, you know, his crush on Valentina got me thinking. I have a crush um, on her too. Don't worry. It, it, it's a family Jeremy. thing. Well, it's okay. I, I got a crush on Rose, so it's all good. Um, <laughs> the Rose. So I, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you guys. Being that Valentina is overrated in one way or another, and we can all admit that, who do you guys think, if you could just spitballing here off the top of your head, who would be on your list of overrated mixed martial arts fighters that you, you think get far too much credit either for their accolades or their skill or, you know? Okay, this is tough, and I don't want to get beat up. So I'm going to let you guys take this one to start off with. But, yeah, I'm going to jump in. In terms of, wait, what are we talking? Current era? Uh, anything. Anything. All time? Or... Anything. Well, an interesting one for me is uh, is always, and please forgive me if I'm wrong, like, I understand why Shogun Hua is just a legend. Mm-hmm. But then when I go back and look at, like, Lyoto Machida's run, I'm always like... Really? Oh, and he's one of my favorite fighters. Are you saying Machida is overrated or Shogun is overrated? I'm saying Machida for me. Like, his skill set. Like, I just think it was, like, the awkwardness. Yeah, it was... That's the thing. It was an interesting technical question at the time. And I think maybe we'd remember his legacy a little differently if it weren't for John Jones. It, well, yeah, maybe. But, but I, like, I, 
Dude, there was like a there was a five year period where Machida, honestly, I didn't think he got hit with a significant strike at all. Like it was weird. Like, yeah. it, like going into that Rashad Evans fight, like they were saying like this guy doesn't get hit at all. Like he had like the lowest like uh strike absorption rate of like all time in the like, the, the division or something like that. Like and you know what? You know what? Honestly, it was that he was an early Wonder Boy, an early Conor McGregor in the sense of that, like, fencing sideways style in yeah. and out. And you could teach a point fighting guy how to fight. He was that. He was he was like the what if you can teach a point fighting guy how to fight in the mixed martial arts con- and he um, was like, context. And he's yeah. like Japanese and Brazilian. Like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> I think he did a great job, uh, techni- you know as far as those technical uh, skills of limiting exchanges. And it's true, like up and, you know, through the Rashad Evans fight, right? Up through his entire run to get to the title, he only lost one round. I don't know if you guys remember that. And it was the first round in the Sokoju fight, which he ended oh, up winning. Yeah. So he, other than that, he hadn't lost a round in his entire title fight. And he did it largely by, you know, in classic point fighting style, limiting exchanges and being extremely elusive. We're not going to have exchanges. We're going to have two or three per round and I'm going to win them all. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. In a very kind of, um, you know, not what, what's his name? The guy that Lomachenko fought Cuban boxer. I guess it's a very Cuban Salido? style. No. Um, um little Linares? guy. No Cuban oh, guy, black gentleman. Rig it down. Rig it down. Rig it down. Rig yeah, it down. exactly. So, yeah, so you, really, eh? Machida's your pick for uh, for overrated fighter. I mean, I wouldn't say, like, when just in terms of when we consider it, especially because um, Michael just put uh, Tony Ferguson number six on the all-time list, which is one of the craziest, like, takes I've ever heard. Um, I think, you I think pantheon he's, yeah, of, like, six. MMA rates. Sorry, go on. No, I think he's six. Wow, he's six. that's 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 the hell of a take. Um, when we consider the pantheon of, of MMA greats, it's just I know Machido was one of those people who for me got who got me really into the sport. But when I look back, I'm like, yeah, he's really good. But like there were like now I'm not so sure whether he would be able to deal with even like a Dominic Reyes or like a, a Gustafson, like a. Well, like you have to remember, he fought, he fought in a time where that division looked stacked. Like, you had Rampage, you had Forrest Griffin, like, all in their prime or, like, just okay. on the decline. Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to say because, like, I'll, I'll, I'll say two things. One, the division size-wise has gotten a lot bigger. That's like. It. Yeah. Machida, size-wise, Machida was a 185er by today's standards. But you look at the Reyes's and the uh, the Gustafsons, they're massive. Yeah, the one, one, 205 is a huge division now. Um, yeah. So I agree on that point. But, like, if we if we play the, the game of this modern-day fighter could beat this fighter from this previous era, you know, like, we would... We, we would be discounting all of the contributions of the, the old legends. Hoist right. Gracie of UFC one would get beaten by a competitive blue belt today. Right. Um, and that's just a fact, but the, the fact was jujitsu was less developed as an art form at the time. And for that reason, you know, he deserved credit within the context of what he achieved. You know what I mean? Mm. Okay. You- I, I wish I had more time to prep for this. I would have probably picked a better name than Machida, but, uh, it's, yeah. it's an no, interesting it's choice, though. Take. I think it's solid. I, I really do think it's solid. Mike, what do you think? You got you. Who, who do you think is it would be one of your? You can come up with multiple picks for overrated fighter that you think gets too uh, much. Clout. Man, you know what? The one that comes to mind for me is Uriah Faber. Now, I think Uriah Faber is a pioneer in the sport. I think he's a pioneer. Um, I think he's a guy. Team Alpha Male is one of the best camps in the world. Like, you know, period. Um, and as a fighter, he was a good fighter. Don't get me wrong. I just think that there's a reason why he never won a UFC title. I'll put it like that, you know, um, good wrestler, right. You know, definitely was, was really good at what he did, but you know, you definitely, I just, I wouldn't necessarily say he's a journeyman or anything like that per se, but whenever there was someone better, he definitely wasn't good enough. He was good enough to get to the dance. I, like I, if so-and-so gets injured, but not. Yeah, I think I think he, he gatekeeper 
for much huh? of his career, I think for much of his career, he was a gatekeeper, and that's the term you're looking for. Mm-hmm, Especially, mm-hmm. maybe not so much in the WEC before the Mike Thomas Brown fights. Mm-hmm. Um, but I agree, and like his technical limitations were very apparent. You know, Dominic Cruz made the joke of overhand rights and guillotines were all he had, and yeah, like I, you know, you look at you look at his. Look, you look at his record and a lot of his wins, like submission, like how many guillotine choke wins does he have? Ten guillotine chokes? He's a master of the guillotine choke. But um, like besides that, like I'm not really – like, okay, for example, for example, right? Let's go to the UFC days. If you saw him versus Dominic Cruz, was there any doubt that Dominic Cruz was going to win that fight? Not in the slightest. Be honest. Not in Be the honest. slightest. Okay. Hen and Burrell before TJ Dillashaw really gave him the gears. Did anyone think he was gonna lo- he was gonna beat Hen and Burrell? Jose Aldo, you right? He beat Jose Aldo. Well, post. Uh, ah, no. No, 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 no. You, you you forget that Jose Aldo was the man. No, he was the man. He was the man. I think I, I, Jose Aldo now still whoops him. So like, yeah. I I I, th- I think that's a I think that's a really good point for I I think I agree with you uh, about Uriah Faber being overrated because we're not denying that he's a talent. We're not denying that he could beat elite level competition. We're not denying that you know he was certainly a, a high caliber fighter. But at the same and time, and a pioneer. Yeah, and a pioneer, and a pioneer. But the amount of credit he gets, you know, for being thank you a UFC a, Hall of he, Famer. Does he deserve to be a UFC Hall of Famer? I, I don't think so. And I think, yeah. He gets put in mythological status sometimes, and I'm like, I don't know if I'd go that far. Um, but the problem is with the UFC Hall of Fame is it's it's a Hall of Fame based on people we like and not people like with accolades. Like, I don't think Jose Aldo is going to be in the Hall of Fame, in the UFC Hall of Fame. And why? Because Dana White hates him, right? So yeah. it's like – so, oh, Nate Marquardt. Nate Marquardt, for that for that matter, I think deserves to be in the UFC Hall of Fame, but never will be. You know, John Fitch, no way, Jose. So it's like, <laughs> you, you're getting. So I feel like the Hall of Fame thing. It should it shouldn't be a UFC Hall of Fame. It should be an MMA Hall of Fame. You know, and it should be based on guys off of accolades. And if we have that conversation, then there's a lot of guys who get in, and there's a lot of guys who don't. Right, based on, you know based on that kind of criteria like you know I, I there's a couple other guys that come to mind but like the one guy i always think about was uriah faber and i like uriah faber i think you know good fighter um and he comes off as a great guy and a pioneer of the sport but i don't know if i'd put him as hall of fame or elite championship wielding material like other people do you know i think that's a fair assessment yeah um, for me, I tend to defer to, uh, the more older heads when it comes to like overrating or underrating guys. But, um, I think like for me, I gotta say Conor McGregor only because like around that, like now he's kind of like accurately assessed, but like around like that 2015, like where he was like considered like such a dominant force in the lightweight division I just was like even at the time when I was like a novice I was like I don't see it and like when he lost to Nate Diaz uh I think it was by like submission or something or Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it was by submission uh it kind of just confirmed like for me like yeah this guy's really not like at that godlike level that everyone was like putting him up to be because like I kind of grew up like when UFC started to like find its legs or like when I found my legs in the UFC, I kind of grew up like looking at dominance, holding dominance to the pedestal of like Anderson Silva or like George St. Pierre. Yeah, GSP too, but like GSP, I I wasn't really like I was more so watching the bigger guys. Mm. Uh, I wasn't really watching like little guys fight like that, but little G- guys. GSP is one way class <laughs> down from Anderson Silva. He's just little. Clear. He's little. He's little? Bro, he's, he's little. bigger than you are. You know what's crazy, though? You know what's crazy, <laughs> though? What's GS- it was weird. Remember when there was a lot of that talk of Anderson Silva? No, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. GSP I just want to finish my Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Um, yeah, like, and I just didn't really see him be having that kind of, like, potential or trajectory uh, for his career. So, like, I think recently he's more, like, accurately assessed, but at the time... 
I was just like, eh, I don't really see it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you because I, not that Conor McGregor is not incredibly talented. What he was able to do against Eddie Alvarez was astounding, given the talent that Eddie Alvarez is. I but was I was shocked. I the, was yeah. Long- at the same time, I remember exactly the you know the time in uh, MMA history that Jeremy was talking about, where people were talking about Conor McGregor like he was a mythological figure, and it was like, guys, not that not that I'm not high on this guy, not that I don't believe that he's capable of great things, but before we start having talking about him like he's the next GSP, can we wait a second? Can we see what he's capable of? Can he take on some more talents, or are you just you know, did you just come to the sport yesterday and you, you, you know, you saw some of the quotes on YouTube and now you're, you're buying into the hype. You know what I mean? It wasn't so much that he'd given us reason to not believe it. It was just that there were so many unanswered questions and people were so willing to, you know, act like we knew what the limits of this guy's potential were. I'd say the exact opposite, honestly. Sorry to cut you off, Michael. Um, no, go ahead, go ahead. I got to get my laptop charger. So I'm going to make this a quick point for me. But um, I actually think Conor McGregor is underrated in terms of his actual technical abilities. Right in terms now. Of overall, like, I think overall he was always underrated. I think, like, his marketing what? and his – no, I think, like, his um, – Are you saying that because of the Donald Cerrone fight? How no. How can no, no, you say no, he no. was always think, underrated? Oh, uh, in terms of his technical ability, like, as a fighter. Fight he was getting in 2015? Well, look, like as I a think, fighter, I think it was technically underrated. Um, I think, there is I, I think what's ahead. happened since he, what happened with Khabib is just Khabib was just a better fighter. And since then, I think the game's evolved. So I think if he fights other fighters, I think he'd be very surprised. I don't think he's as close to the top as he used to be, perhaps. Um, I mean, if you think about like some of the guys he was fighting back back then, like, Oh, anyway, no. No, Marcus, no, I'm gonna, I disagree with everything you said there. Okay, well, we can keep going into it. Um, but for me, my point is just that I, I think we underrated his technical abilities. However, I think that's... Yeah, you know what? No, that's it. That's it. I'll leave I think it there. I, I, I think I, I'll currently... support this point. I, I will support this point. Um, look, Max Holloway, Dustin Poirier... Jose Aldo, Eddie Alvarez, those are some big names. Conor McGregor, not only beat them, beat the piss out of them, right? Oh, so, yeah. Start so, I, I also yeah. remember my last point. I was going to say that, what's called call it? I think with the Nate Diaz thing, he'd gone up a division, and I think that's where we saw, like, his limitation. Well, Nate, hold on. Nate, Nate Diaz is not a natural 170-pound fighter, let's be honest. Nate Diaz— I said technically. It, I did say technically. Oh, no, I because David said we saw his limitations when he went up a division. Nate Diaz is not a, you know, he's not, he's not the size. We, we saw when he came up against bigger talents like Rory McDonald, how he fares. But I think, I to your point earlier, I think Conor McGregor does very well against anybody in the top 10 without a wrestling heavy style or somebody that can withstand his... Um, his power in the early going a la Nate Diaz, right? And I'm not saying he'll win, but I think he stands a good chance. I don't think the game's moved so quickly that he doesn't stand a very good chance against anyone in the top 10 of uh, of lightweight at the moment. Mm, no, no. Without no, a wrestling not that he doesn't stand a good chance. I just think, like, there are definitely guys that could beat him. There are definitely guys that could beat him. So, exactly. uh, I, 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 I have a couple of interesting ones. I, I, may, I may have given more time because I kind of came up with this on the fly, but given more, go ahead. Yeah, hey, you do your thing. Given more time, my picks might be a little bit different. But the two that came uh, to the to uh, the top of my head when I was thinking about overrated fighters, I got one from the men's division, and uh, one from the women's division. And the one from the women's division would be Misha Tate. Ooh. I think wow. incredibly overrated. For for me, not that I. For me, when I, I when I look at top five of like best women of all time. Well, when I look at her style, I don't see anything particularly impressive. Her striking was, you know, basic, a little bit robotic. Um, her her grappling was, you know, she she was a good grappler. She got the good the job done. But I think um, as far as her accolades go, let's let's look at the Holly Holm fight. Um, she wins the title with that submission. I'm not going to call it a fluke because well, I hate that, that was term. a mirror. Let's be honest. That yes, Let's if be we honest. run, it's a miracle. yeah, I think if we run a simulation, um, 
if we run that uh, that fight in a simulation a hundred times, how many times does do we get that result? Twenty. Twenty out of a hundred. I would say less. I would say less. I think I think it's a very small percentage of the time that that happens. I think most of the time, Holly Holm uh, backpedals is able to you know deny her engagements and um, you know. Also, you're facing a, a Holly Holm who wasn't as well versed with her wrestling at that point right exactly so so yeah so what if we take that fight um for what it is what other accolades does misha tate really have in her in her career you know we've got the you know when she came up against the more elite competition generally she was beaten against the ronda rousey's against the uh uh, amanda nunez's which i mean you know no shame there ronda rousey and amanda nunez were are were and are elite but at the same time, I don't think Misha Tate really qualifies to be in the conversation of elite of the elite as she is based on her accolades and her skill level, if we're being quite honest. OK, um, I, I, I I'm inclined to disagree. But like at the same time, you make a good point, though, like. And hey, let's 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 remind ourselves, like we're talking um within the elite of the elite right like these are still yeah elite we're talking players. some of the best yeah yeah right it's just my issue like in the reason why i tend to kind of you know look not really my only thing is is that like she fought at a time where it, women's mma right like was not it's if you think like now like there's a disparity back then jesus christ H Christ, it was, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm not saying that to disparage them. I'm just saying it was a young sport, right? And she was a person who was who was relatively young. Like, everyone has to remember, Misha Tate's only 33, right? So, you know, she was a young girl fighting in a, I shouldn't say girl, like disrespecting. She was a young woman fighting in a young sport, right? You know, still learning on the fly against other women learning on the fly. So, you know, in terms of her style, I'm inclined to agree it is unflattering, but like how many women around her time, bef- like, and we're talking pre-UFC, um, had an unflattering, like had a, fla- a style where you're like, oh, that's flattering. Like maybe Gina Carano, maybe Cyborg, where you're like, you know, these are like legit lifelong fighters who are kind of doing their thing, right? And Notice that's how good. none of what you said involved accolades or skill, though. That's a good point. That's a good point, right? It's like, but you know what? Definitely, she's, I just think that, like, when I think of her, like, it's, for me, it's Nunez, Cyborg, Rousey, and then you can have a conversation, right? Like, so it's like, where does Misha Tate stack up? I would put her, like, somewhere in or around that top five, because, Besides that, like maybe Carano, like would you put Gina Carano at number four? Again, we're right? we're talking about a young division, one that hasn't always been very deep. I mean, it's it's hard to say. I think I'm uncomfortable at this point even making uh, a pound for pound historically with those that division. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. But that's my whole point is that like besides those three, it's like who can you really say okay deserves to be in that great list and. You know, like, that's my whole thing with Misha Tate. It's like, what's, like, what's overrated for her? Because, like, it, my my thing is, she's in the top five. Does she deserve to be in the top five? Can you say she doesn't? What's the definitive argument to say she's not, right? Well, here's the thing. We're talking top five of 135. I bet if I asked you to right now, you'd struggle to um, name a top ten of all time of women's 135. And if you could, by the time we got to six, seven, eight, and nine, it would be pretty questionable. <laughs> you know? yeah. We'd be, we'd be, yeah. we'd be, we'd be throwing in the Raquel Pennington's and no disrespect to Raquel Pennington. I don't think she deserves to be on anybody's all time. Rocky. 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 I think the top five is pretty formidable and, and debatable. Um, I'm, I'm trying I, to, think I would have to toss Holly home in there. I would have to toss Holly home in there just because she might not have done it at the final stage. No. Well, she did. She won the title against Rousey. Well, you um, say Holly Holm is overrated? Shishenko, no, right? no, no. I would say she has to be considered in that top five pound for pound greatest uh, 135ers, in my opinion. Would and you then when you get to six, Shishenko you're like, wait, who else? She could technically beat Holm, right? 
when you get to six, you're like, wait, hold on. Who else fought at women's 135 here? Uh, <laughs> Reen Nakai, Conor McGregor. Uh, <laughs> hey, you don't, don't besmirch Brock Lesnar, Brock Lesnar, number don't six. Don't besmirch the good name of Reen Nakai before I come down there. Right? Don't <laughs> oh, by bes- the way, speaking of Misha Tate, I have a story about Misha Tate that I wish I could tell on air. We'll so talk. badly. We'll talk. I think it's yeah, the same but- story. Are we, are we talking about the same story? Uh, we'll, talk, it, we'll talk, we'll talk, It involves a club. We'll talk, we'll talk. Yeah, yeah, Guys, we'll can all three of you please stick around afterwards? I'd love to tell you the story, but I can't tell it on air because I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk. I think, we, I, think I know the same story. I think I know the same did story. I, did I tell you it before? No, like I heard it from somebody, but like we'll Oh, talk. no, you, you, no, you, you haven't heard this one then. <laughs> all right, okay. So are we going to do a breakdown of the card or do you want to leave that to next week? Um, we're about like an hour in. Let's go yeah, let's leave that to next. More like hour twenty. Plus, Mike still got a story. He he said he had a story he okay. wanted to tell, some kind of a Doug Ford story. Well, the other thing was the in the news. I forgot about this. The Last Dance documentary, because I am planning yeah. on releasing this podcast episode Sunday before the episode three and four, and episode one and two of the Last Dance happened last week. I got a chance to watch it. Before um, we before we go to the Last Dance, can I just give a quick uh, opinion about? my winners of the NFL draft that took place. Sure. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. So um, really quick, uh, NFL draft, draft took place from Thursday, April 23rd to uh, Saturday, April 25th, I believe. And um, just based on teams who, who added to their roster, uh, to win right now, I would say my biggest winners were the Baltimore Ravens. They are already a loaded offense, and they added uh, key defensive pieces, defensive studs, um, uh, LSU linebacker, um, They added uh, really key defensive uh, pieces. They added a, a linebacker. Uh, Jesus, how, how am I forgetting his name? Hold on. As, as I Patrick, saw- Queen, Patrick Queen, and then uh, they got a steal in J.K. Dobbins. <coughs> Excuse me. From Ohio you know, LSU State. LSU had a good night, though. Good or bad yeah. night. <laughs> yeah, they, they, LSU, LSU had 14 draft picks, which tied for, for a record. For a NFL draft record, hold on, <clears throat> give me a second. Yeah. Um, Coronavirus. Shout out to it's, CD it's Lamb. Corona. Shout out to real. CD uh, Lamb, who um <coughs> was drafted by the Cowboys, and immediately after, his girlfriend tried to take his phone. For, <laughs> for that was hilarious. lovely. I that love that so much. <laughs> Right, and he was like, "Uh, no." <laughs> yeah, and, but it was, but it was, re- but it was a really good, it was a really good draft by the Baltimore Ravens because they got three picks in the third, they got four picks in the third round. Two of them were on the defensive side of the ball, so they're really stacking up that defense. They're gonna be deadly, and then they also added a really good um, piece on the offensive line. My second winner from the NFL draft. Uh, was the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with uh, the addition of Tom Brady and Rob Gonkrowski. They've also added uh, really good pieces to help them. They had added a, a running back, um, and they also added uh, – they're just shoring up their needs. So I thought that they did a, a really good job. And then, I'll tell you uh, what, though. They need some linemen, though. They need some linemen. No, they, they, they add, their, their first round pick was a tackle. Uh, I forget – yeah, they need more linemen for sure, but yeah, um, like it's not enough. They need some linemen. But, no, but they definitely added. They definitely added some good pieces to help Tom Brady. Mm-hmm. Like, and then um, my third uh, winner from the NFL draft was the uh, Tampa Bay. I'm sorry, Tampa. Bay, uh, the San Francisco 49ers, um, who also did a good job of. Uh, replacing uh, their losses on the defensive on the defensive line um, and also adding a lot of uh, really good pieces on offense um, I'm surprised that uh, that Brandon I, I I always struggle saying his last name but Brandon Ayuk 
from uh, Arizona State dropped so low because this was such a wide receiver rich draft. And the fact that a lot of teams just ignored the wide receiver position. You know, what, in, in particular, that, Philadelphia really, I thought, I was really disappointed in yeah. them not picking him up. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of teams that could have benefited from such a rich wide receiver class decided to uh, go other directions. Also, for some reason, a team that could have used uh, wide receivers, the Green Bay Pack, the Green Bay Pack Packers, also decided to uh, get a backup uh, go with Jordan Love. I was uh, interested in that. I'm interested yeah. in that. You know what that tells me though? It tells me that they're not as confident in Aaron Rodgers as that's we are as fans. That's, I don't know why they that. Would, I mean, maybe they know something we don't, but that's ridiculous. I think. Um, because he, you know what the thing is, I let, let's let's you know call a spade a spade with Aaron Rodgers. He is he can be, you know, a bit of a curmudgeon, right? I know he, he has. I know he has that. issues. I know he has issues with the with the quarterback with the quarterback coach on the uh, Packers. Like, cause not that he has issues with him, but that he he's a handful to deal with. That's all liked, I'm saying. He liked the previous coach better, mm-hmm. but um. Yeah, I thought that they, I thought that they wasted their first round pick. Well, not wasted, but because Jordan Love is a good player, but I thought that they um, made might have made a poor decision there. But yeah, uh, I thought the San Francisco 49ers uh, did a good job. So those are three teams that I think did a good job in uh, adding to their roster to be able to compete next year. I think down the line, you had some good draft classes from like the Cowboys. The Broncos, the Lions, the Colts, the Rams. I think those guys. Uh, I think two, three years down the road, those uh, picks are going to uh, start to like pay dividends. But um, I think for the most part, my Baltimore Ravens are definitely doing good things. So uh, yeah. yeah, that was a uh, that was basically that's basically it. That's that's it was a it was a entertain it was definitely entertaining. Uh, all the picks being at home, but yeah, it was it was a uh, it was an entertaining um entertaining three days. I had a friend, see, you know, completely football unrelated. But I had a friend who was like, I saw a lot of milk in that draft. And I'm not yeah. talking about the food. <laughs> I was dying. <laughs> That's cool. You know, if if you know, you know, you know, yeah. you know. Um. But anyway, on to the last dance. Um, quick thought before we get into the story times, I guess, or ask question segments. Um, did anyone oh. watch the last dance, or what did you think of it? Yeah, yeah, I've got some yep. thoughts on the last dance. Man. I have actually. I, I'm so, surprised you're saying quick thoughts. I thought like this podcast was going to be mostly a reaction to the last dance. That's how how thorough I was prepared for this. It might have been, but we're an hour and twenty two in. You know. <laughs> Let, listen, man. Okay, so like you guys. I, you know, I knew about Michael Jordan growing up, of course, and that he was a legend. And, you know, we've all seen Space Jam. We've all seen the shoes. And until this documentary came around, my God, wow. I did not realize just how little I care about basketball. (laughs) 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 Not only have I not seen this documentary, but I will never see this documentary. Basketball is not a real sport. On to you, Mike. Why you, why you always do that? Why you always do that? Like, (laughs) we're too early in the quarantine let like uh let let's be inside for a couple more months eventually he's gonna run out of stuff to watch and he's gonna fall on this like i would definitely recommend it and it's funny you say that stefano sorry going oh i was gonna say i'll exhaust the entire video catalog of x hamster before i get into (laughs) it you mean you you haven't already the holy bible Bible. (laughs) oh yeah holy bible leviticus love that stuff (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, what's funny is that uh, I'm actually I'm gonna I'm a soft confessed not a huge huge basketball fan. I'm probably way definitely way more of a soccer fan and more of an MMA fan. But I do enjoy uh, basketball casually, and I'm a little bit avid about uh, the Raptors. Um, so what I consider best players of all time. In terms of when I started following basketball, it's easily LeBron James because that's just all I've heard about when I, in my generation growing up. You know, before that, I heard about Shaquille O'Neal, I think. 
Um, I remember, not that anybody cares, but I remember being in like growing up in Africa, hearing about Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant. So you grew up in you know, Africa? Yeah, yeah, he's Nigerian. I, yeah, I'm Nigeria. Like yeah, but I didn't know you, you know, grew up in Nigeria. I thought sure. you. I knew you lived in England for a bit. I did, and Asia, but that's a story for another day. Um, <laughs> David's got an interesting. He's got an interesting backstory. He's got some depth here to his character. He's He's like Abe Batuta, except like you know, new age. Um, (laughs) Anyway, uh, what'd you call it? But that's to say that I was never really into basketball. Um, so I never really got to catch the Michael Jordan era because you know his first title was pretty much when I was born, or no, his his last of his three P. Yeah, no, his first, his last title of his first. Three people was the year I was born. Um, so you can't blame me for not being as school as Michael Jordan. So watching this, uh, I was really skeptical going into this documentary because I was like, oh, yeah, here we go. More MJ, more, oh, he's the greatest of all time. Let me guess, he made some really cool shoes, blah, blah, blah. Man, no, this is, this is something special. Like, what they've done is... Nothing short of impressive. You don't, and I would say you don't even have to be a sports fan. Like from a filmmaker perspective, what they've done is actually in, all right. Okay, you can laugh because think about it. Even in like the the storyline of like the documentary itself is that they filmed this in like '97. They then did interviews over the next let's say 10, 15 years. It sat in like a, a closet basically for like 10 years. And then only recently did they get permission to like conduct another round of interviews and then um, release it. So you can imagine like trying to piece all of that historical data together. Like I think I think they did a really good job. Told a really like, compelling, yeah. really yeah. compelling story. Listen, if you want to, if you want to see, I'll say one thing. If you want to see greatness, if you want to see uh, true heroes achieving their potential and legacies. Go on Netflix. How did you know I was going to say Tiger? <laughs> How did you know I was going to say Tiger? <laughs> Thank you for shutting that. Shit. Thank you for shutting that shit down. Hey, hey. Wow. Hey. How did you know I was going to say? Sith is not a bad very one. clean. Sorry, man. I was the joke. I don't Listen, know. Tiger shit. King. Tiger King is for white people. What that Michael Jordan documentary <laughs> is for black people. Okay. No, <laughs> Jordan. Jordan is ever, really yeah. <laughs> No, <laughs> no. But honestly. No, honestly, just to give a background of my of my basketball knowledge, I grew up in Toronto. Um, Michael Jordan's last title, 97-98. I was born in 97, so I was born during his last title. So I also missed the Jordan era. Didn't really get to experience the Kobe-Shaq dominance era. So growing up, it was really all about the Spurs and then I really got, and then when I really started to actually grasp the concepts of basketball, it was taken over by Kobe. Um, but then we all really kind of decided that it was LeBron who was the best, the GOAT, because that was our era. He's like, he's the GOAT of our era. I mean, growing up in Toronto, though, my favorite player, and I would always like just say it out of loyalty, was Vince Carter. Tracy McGrady. Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> But, um, yeah, you're right. Like, this documentary is something to behold. It's honestly, like, the three things that I really got from it was, um, you know, who was responsible. We're starting to see who's responsible for the breakup of a dynasty. Um, at least Spoiler. in the first two episodes. Spoiler. It's not yes. like, why? Okay, yeah. and thank you for saying that. Thank no, you very much, Scotty Pippen. First. And then... Um, we got to learn uh, more about Scottie Pippen. Like in these first two episodes, we got to learn more about Scottie Pippen and his legacy. And then we're learning about the greatness of Michael Jordan. And I'm and I'm just saying, like, if you wanna if you wanna watch Stefano kind of stole my sound bite, but if you wanna learn about greatness, like just not sports greatness or basketball greatness, greatness, then watch this documentary. Like just watch when Jordan falls down, how quickly he gets back up. Like, watch things. Just something that really stood out to me was when they said Jordan would compete every day because he knew, like, there was somebody in that stadium who never watched him play before, and he wasn't going to let them leave by saying, oh, I watched this guy play, and he only put up 15 points. Like, that's incredible. Like, the amount 
you, you, when you get to go inside the, 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 the sociopathic mind of somebody who wants to win at all costs, like we all, we all kind of have that fire inside. What's like, I remember coming, growing up, like I hated to lose. Like I hated to lose more than I love to win. Like if Michael beat me at, video games which was a lot like i would want to fight i would want to which i would want to we would want to fight i would want to fight him like little brothers little brothers of the world unite no little brothers of the world unite like that was part of the documentary though yeah no like if like we all kind of have that for like if you beat me at recess at anything basketball soccer football if we were playing hockey if you found a way to beat me at hockey i'm not even good at hockey if you beat me at hockey the next recess, I wasn't talking to you for the entire time until next recess when I could write that wrong. Like, we all have that fire. And in society today, it's kind of quelled. So, like, people kind of look at you like, what's wrong with you? Why do you care so much about that sport? But, like, this is what you need to be great. Like, I'm not saying be petty and be, like, all childish about losing or whatever. But, like, you need to hate losing. Like, and that's what I love about this documentary is, like, it shows us, like, what – if you foster if you foster that fire, what you can become. And I just love this documentary. I love learning about like and I'm not gonna say like I'm not gonna make go as far as making fun of Jerry Krause because I mean the man is dead. Like that's just disrespectful. But like Is he but no seriously, do you know what's interesting? And uh, I'm so sorry to jump in, but I No, go ahead. I just wanna say that I had the exact same point, like same takeaways. I literally watched this at like 3 a.m. this morning, just you don't even want to get into it. But anyway, um, yeah, yeah I, my point was like MJ oh is just. Oh my god, without, Jay Cross is dead. Wow. Yeah, he is dead. But yeah. Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time, and might be one of the best sports athletes of all time in terms no, of like. His, I think that's not in dispute. Yeah. It's him. Yeah. It's him, Muhammad Ali and Babe Ruth, probably. Okay, but I. You see, wait, 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 I, hold on, hold on. I don't care about. If you're gonna say, if you're gonna say Muhammad Ali, you're gonna have to say Rocky Marciano as well. Thank you very much. You see, that's the problem. I think I've heard that name like a few times. I'm not even entirely sure who that is, to be honest. Uh, I'll just for context, for context, I just like to say that Rocky Marciano retired undefeated. Yeah. Muhammad Ali did not. So. But that's not how it works. And you no, know, but we're talking about. So don't do that. It's not just. It's not just about sports, though. It's about everything that surrounds you. Okay, uh, guys, I, you know. But, I, no, I just I, to no, but 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 back on Jerry Cross, though. Back on Jerry Cross, like I think a lot. I think a lot of why he was such like so like played with villain was because he kind of brought him on himself. Like he wanted that credit. He wanted that ego. He wanted that credit so much. Like. And he was willing to get rid of the best coach of, of all. Of do you know the funny thing? What's up? Sorry, do you know the funny thing is that, and Michael hasn't said anything in a long time, but what, no, what, he's, he's what's go funny last. about this is that I actually, because I don't know too much about it, but what I do know is that documentaries are rarely ever telling the truth or reality. They are just uh, uh, an account of one person's side of the story or multiple people, but they're just that they're just that an account. I actually think that they did Jerry Carl super dirty because they no, were they disrespecting did. him in the dock. They were yeah. blaming everything that went wrong on one guy as if like the owner was there. Bl- no, like, okay, yeah. Reinsdorf has yeah. Reinsdorf has a couple of those Considering, think about it this way: that video, that documentary is never ever getting made or released unless Michael Jordan signs off on it. Who is the one person Michael Jordan would want to throw under the bus in this kind of documentary? Jerry it, Krause. Exactly. So, like, what? So, what are they gonna do inside the documentary? Are they gonna be like, actually, Michael Jordan could have done this? No, they're gonna be like, yeah, it's actually the other guy. Well, I will say they weren't like it's this is the least romantic view of Michael Jordan I've seen from like a media piece in a long time. Okay, I'll agree with that, but I'll also say that it was super uh, and this is a Christian podcast, so I'm gonna watch my language. But it was also very uh, 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 what's the word? Uh, loving, uh, of uh, adoring. Uh, there's a lot of adulation going on. Yeah, uh, yeah, I get what you're saying. It was an it was yeah. an interesting documentary. Yeah, like, there was a lot of uh, a lot of people were on their knees in adulation. We'll just say that because on their knees were they, they were, were they praying. worshiping our they Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Exactly. 
Thank they you. Were Thank you. With Worship, oral sex? Worshipping hard. Worshipping <laughs> with oral sex. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Wait, what was it? <laughs> no, he was great, but the way that they were talking about him was, at that point, it was like he wasn't human. And don't get me wrong, he's a special, special human that most of us would only dream to get to that kind of greatness. But at the same time, first of all, like, it, it takes a team to win any game. And I don't think enough people talked about that. Um, oh. I know they kind of try to do that with Scotty, and they did him dirty, but also... D- like, he really fumbled the bag, eh? <laughs> oh, man, but did he, though? At the time he, he signed it, he was like a top 20 signed, like a top 20 contract or something. And it was only like seven... He signed a seven-year contract. A seven-year contract. Dude, dude, that contract was super team-friendly. Yeah, man. Ooh, anyway, crazy. sorry. Those, those were my thoughts. It was just that I thought Jerry Krause got set up in the documentary. And even during the time, I, I can imagine, if you think about LeBron James right now, anything that goes wrong, we're never blaming LeBron James. It's always somebody else's fault because he's such an amazing basketball player. That can't yeah. be the case all of the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, my thoughts on it, like, considering the fact that I actually know about this, like, it was kind of interesting to hear, like, I knew Jerry Krause and Phil Jackson didn't like each other, right? But, like, I didn't realize just how much. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't realize it got to that point. I knew Michael Jordan and Scotty, like, it was, like, a very weird hot and cold friendship. But I didn't realize just how hot and cold it was. Like, you know... There was there was a lot of like stuff that like you know when you, when you see you're like oh I didn't realize it was that bad I didn't realize they were having that many problems I didn't realize you know like like for example Michael Jordan was in the '84 draft right this is around the time where the NBA was just starting to clean up their drug issues right I didn't realize that Michael Jordan was also in an era where like so much for saying that do you believe that Michael Jordan as a 23 year old or 21-year-old, walked down, was hearing noises in his hotel room, his team hotel room, walked down to his teammate's room, knocked on the door. When they opened it, they saw all, he saw all the paraphernalia. Uh, according to him, the drugs, the the gambling, and the women. And he was like, nope, not for me. I 100% nope. do. I 100%, <laughs> do. I 100% Are you do. kidding me? Yes, I have to say. Considering where Jordan got to, I think considering where Jordan got to, and considering the other horror stories you've heard, like, look, NBA history is full of, in the 70s especially, is full of guys like Marvin Barnes, Michael J. Richardson, guys who fell into that, were good stars, and fell off a cliff. And and, and not just that, and not just that. Jordan, who were drinking and gambling all night during the, the, the finals. Like what are you talking about? He was no, but no, not, no, I know, no, I know. Hold on, hold on, hold on. He was doing like uh, Mike. For example, thank. Oh my goodness, I'm recycling arguments. But Mike Tyson uh, during the Buster Douglas fight, he was doing like blow all night basically. And uh, what happened to him during the Mike the Buster Douglas? Sure, fight? but he was always he he was also winning before that. Even John Jones, like John Jones, is doing like who knows yeah. what. It's 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 hard to say because there's there's some people that really are just special talents that can consume copious amounts of drugs and succeed in spite of it, right? There's some people who have responsible enough drug use where you know they'll do a couple nights of blow here and there, but they're always at practice the next day. And then there there are actually some people who manage to stay straight edge despite having you know all kinds of distractions and drugs and women and all kinds of things surrounding them. So I don't know anything about Michael Jordan, but I'm willing to believe all th- any of those scenarios. Allegedly, there's documented I, evidence of him taking multiple substances. Allegedly. No, but let me just jump in here. No, no, no I should say I, that. I, We're about, well, hold on. I, about I, Michael. I have to say a word. Please, hear me. Let me say a sentence. Let me say a sentence, please. Right after okay. I finished that, well, all I heard here's was... Here's what I'm going to say. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say this. Like, this is the point I was trying to make is that, like, you see the 70s where guys are guys are falling off of a cliff after one all-star year. Why? Because of drugs. But then you see guys who do well and, you know, fall off of, like, don't fall, uh, d- like, keep okay. on doing drugs and keep on, you know, like engaging in, in sort of illegal activity. But I think 
the thing is, is that you don't really know. And until you see know. evidence that suggests know. otherwise, Let me you have to keep I don't want to answer Dave's question. I just want to answer Dave's question about do you think Michael Jordan was in? Like, you have to think about what Michael Jordan was coming out of college. Like, did you see that letter that he wrote to his mother? Like, it was so innocent, like, so naive. It's not the fact that he wasn't... Oh, tempted. man. No, it's not the Come fact on, that he wasn't man. tempted. It's not the fact, it's not the fact that he wasn't Wait. tempted. But, but listen to what he said. Listen to what he said. If the police come in here and raid this, this room, I'm as guilty as everybody man. here. Like, I can, I, can, I can picture being in that situation. Just because I've been to college, like, okay. like that was my biggest fear was going to jail because of something like being being guilty by association. Like that is actually a real fear, no matter how, no matter. But if Jeremy, you, the but the problem is, is like, yeah, there's Michael Jordan, but there's also Len Bias, right? Who everyone was like, remember Len Bias? Remember the story of Len Bias, where Len Bias was Len was Bias. put on a pedestal and and told. You know, he's great and he was a nice guy. In fact, people thought he was nicer in terms of personality than Michael Jordan. And what happens to Len Bias? He dies of cocaine overdose, right? You don't okay. know. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Just because the man was doing cocaine doesn't mean he was not a nice guy. All right. Yeah, no, like, that's not my point. Hold on, hold on. Let's clear the air, point. Mike. Drug point, use does not make you a that, bad person. My point is, is, that's not my point. My point is, is that I know, like, I'm just trying to that shit you. is not the reality. Right. Yeah, so, but Mike, Mike, no, these but, claims no. you're making that doing cocaine makes you not a nice guy or a bad person, frankly, I don't that's care for it. Yeah, that that not, is word not, for a word what you said. No, okay, but I got two points. I got two points. First of all, even though it's a real pressure that we all know that um, you shouldn't do drugs or behave in ne- or just engage in negative behaviors, we all know we're human we all do it to varying degrees. Don't yes, get me wrong. For me. Don't Hold get on. me wrong. Hold but on. we all do it. So you're telling me that a man who chronically smokes now and drinks, not, he had a, 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 a like a pitcher of whiskey while he was doing the interview. <laughs> you want to tell and me? I was slowly going 21. down. <laughs> he was 21. He wasn't 20. He wasn't 19. He was 21. After three years of college, didn't drink, didn't do drugs, didn't do women. Okay. Didn't do didn't do women. Didn't do women. <laughs> no, that's what he said. He says like, oh, wasn't First in the of all, This is the most this is the most sexist sports podcast. First, <laughs> first, 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 Jeremy refers to women as paraphernalia, and then now, I now David. Saw. No. You did. You that said he goes. No, that was, was David. That was yeah, David, David, you sexist pig. Yeah. Come on, man. Women are not paraphernalia. Okay. But anyway, my follow-up question is: Do you think that there are currently NBA players doing drugs? No. Yes. Oh, yes. No. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. yes. We'll talk. We'll talk. You think we NBA will players talk. do drugs? Are you insane? Okay. We'll okay. talk about oh, there. Then oh, they make. Do you think NBA, NBA another players one. make? They take the, they don't buy drugs with that money. Are you kidding me? They don't know. They don't, NBA players go to Sunday school. All right. They okay, put right. those. They put that money in low risk, high reward investments. And uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. They yeah. No, of course they do drugs. <laughs> okay. So okay. I so think, I think I think we're, this gets into kind of the deeper perception of like you know what people want to believe athletes exactly. are doing. Based on, you know, this, is this perception point. that there are these drug-free, clean, point. you know, Cold exactly. War superheroes who are off to go fight the Soviets in, uh, in sport. And it's just not the case. I mean... And I would extend it further and say that this documentary to Michael Jordan was just that. It was just extending what people already believe in Michael Jordan. We already think he's the greatest of all time. We already know he wants to win. We already know he's determined. We already know... Like, what did we really learn from this documentary so far I it's easy to say no i mean in terms of the detail the detail was really good but in terms of like you know was there anything that surprised us like like are we already no, he wasn't like starting was in high school opening. like pardon it was eye-opening was it or you was know, it I heard, told in a you, know, I heard, way? you know i heard something uh interesting and this documentary was actually supposed to come out in june i believe but it, then it got moved up because of the virus. 
But think about the reason why Jordan put it out. Like, if you think about it, by June, LeBron may have possibly very likely would have won his a uh, championship, and then we would all been singing his Not praises. Not if Kawhi Leonard had something to say about it. Right. You okay. watch. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. No, but, uh-huh. but like, but like, we all would have been singing LeBron's praises if he had won. And then this documentary would have came out. So I think, I, and I'm trying to answer like David's point of like why, like maybe yeah, we didn't learn too much, but I think the reason why this documentary is out is to solidify who Michael Jordan is For sure. like, as a sports figure. My last you- point on this, and I won't say anything else. I think that it is an unhealthy, an unhealthy desire we have in modern society to kind of. Oh my goodness, I, I can't talk about it without using ridiculous words. Venerate guys who honestly are pathological in the way that they think. I understand I, I, being determined to win, but you cannot sacrifice your entire social bond. There's many types of leaders. There's many types of winners. There's many types of greatness um, and many pathways to greatness. And I understand Michael Jordan being a beacon of that, but... Like, we got to take it easy with, like, oh, you know, so many people are like, I want to be like Jordan. Like, we got to take it easy. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, I I I I just want to say a quick – can I just add a quick caveat to that? Because I agree with you. Um, I wouldn't necessarily think that we should uh, discourage it but present it in more of, like, a realistic light. Like, yes, what Michael Jordan does is incredible, but, like, the line between uh, extreme brilliance and madness and the line between, like, being able to achieve great things and, like, pathology – it's mm-hmm. a fine line to walk. So I think people need to understand, like, you know, there's genetic components, but with enough hard work, yeah, you can put yourself into greatness, but you're going to, ha- the sacrifice is real mm-hmm. for what you, if you want to get to that point, you're sacrificing a normal life, you know? Exactly. And we're not all going to be Jordan. So there's many people who made very similar sacrifices, had very similar beliefs, similar work ethics, but yep. maybe lack the talent or the luck or whatever. And genetics. Of- yeah, genetics, and were unable to replicate his dynasty. And it's not from a fault of you know they weren't determined enough or they didn't want they don't want it enough. I feel like that's just such a, a sports thing. Like oh, if you yeah. wanted it, like do you think Charles Barkley didn't want to win a championship? You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's almost like. It's like, the, it's, it's the it's it's the it's the fallacy that every single thing is in your control. And like you said, it's a it's a team sport as well, right? It's like. You know, in hockey, Wayne Gretzky is one of the best of all times, but he never won a Stanley Cup after he got traded from the Edmonton Oilers, right? It just, it is, it is what it is. It's like, it's so much of it is luck. So many people never get recognized that are extreme talents, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, give it up. I, I, I just, I really quickly want to frame this discussion from a, a, a quote from one of the, you guys know Darian Caldwell, Bellator MMA fighter? Sure. Sure. So uh, he he put out a tweet that I think really encapsulates this documentary, and uh, I thought this was really powerful. He said, it's funny seeing basketball players walk into the arena, mean mugging with their game face on, like, bruh, you're about to shoot a basket, into a ball into a basket. <laughs> <laughs> but for real, so, though, like, there's so much, like, machismo. It's almost like they're going to war. It's like, oh, no, I'm going to impose my will. And it's like, come on, guys. Like, never, never oh, forget. That, the game, I'm gonna right? say one However more thing. great you are, you're I'm just gonna say about one, to shoot a ball into a basket. I'm going to say one more thing about this documentary, and then I'll shut up, too. I loved when Jordan said, if you have dominance over somebody, you want to make sure that they don't get a chance to gain any kind of confidence. I love that. I love, love, love that. Powerful man. words. Powerful words. Some yeah, men are meant to be. Some men are meant to, yeah. Some men are meant to be happy. They're meant to be great. Scandal. <laughs> Don't at me. What the, no, no. What honestly, wrong? Jeremy, what? Jeremy, you're you're onto something. And like, I think I think for you as like you know someone who's competed in a high level of sports, some of the things that you were saying earlier about like that mentality of how much you wanted to win, about like you know how much it would off put you, even just in a, a simple it would, game. Yeah, play. it would just it, it would just mess with me. A lot of people would look at that and they'd be like, this guy's crazy. But I'm sitting here and I'm sitting here and I'm like, yes, that's the attitude you need to be a winner. Like that's if you 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 show me. A, I love that quote. You show me a sore loser. Sorry. You show me a, uh, a good a, a good loser and I'll show you a loser. 
right? Wrong, like, wrong, wrong, hold wrong, on, hold wrong. on, hold on. Let me, let me wrong. have my, let me have my point. Let me have my point. If you want to, and look, David, I'm not saying it's necessarily, wow. I'm not, wait, hold on, hold on. I know, hold I on. Know. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not, just so passionate about this. I'm I know. Just... I agree. Look, I'm not saying it's the best way, way to raise uh, your kids. And I'm not yeah, saying it's the absolutely. best. Yeah. I'm not saying it's the best way to, you know, the best philosophy to encourage people to live their lives. But if you want to be great in, in sports, man, you gotta, you gotta, <laughs> you've gotta have some pathologies in your head, right? Like yeah, I agree. I'm I'm sure. I mean, obviously none of us are on the level of Jordan, but Jeremy, I'm sure there's times where like you've had a bad performance, even just in in the gym or the training room, and you fucking bald. Oh, sorry, swear word. Jesus, forgive hey, me. Hey, whoa. <laughs> sorry, I get very passionate about this, Mike. I'm sure you can confirm. There's there's been some times. Me personally, I've had um a bad training session and I just sat there and cried afterwards. You know what I mean? Cause it's like you want, when you want something so badly, right. It's, I, I think it's something you can't necessarily teach, you know, okay. that will win. I, I mean, I can't relate to that in, on, on that level, obviously, but I just want to say this, that um, the beauty of sports is it teaches you how to deal with life. Um, even athletes, they still have to leave sports and then deal with life. And that's why we find a, a hard transition. And you're right, in terms of if you want to succeed in sports, you do have to have that dogged self-belief that nothing, that, that you can overcome anything. However, if you want to be balanced in life, you also have to know, and that's why I love MMA, because it's just, it's one of the best metaphors for life, because you win some, you lose some, and at the end of the day, your legacy is judged by how did you perform over the entirety of your career? Not on what was your record or, you know, what are these like statistical things? You know what I mean? Like wise words. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how the Japanese saw it. There's yeah. More. I just think like, that's a much more like, if you think even like tennis, like people lose in tennis all of the time, you lose games, you lose, you know, points, you lose like matches, you lose, you lose balls, you lose, ball, you lose everything. But you uh, learn that's to deal enough. with your losses. Those losses <laughs> motivate you to keep going. And, you know, you, I don't know. That's just a philosophy I have. Not there's everybody's eight, gonna be able to win yeah. all the time. But there's eight, there's eight more episodes. So we'll be able right. to get into these kind of conversations down the line, of course. Uh, but I'll, I do think my, should, I'll, I'll do my best to check it out. Yeah, please do. It's a good documentary. But we're up against this, so we should probably give Michael, like, the final words, and then what are we doing after that? Uh, oh, questions or something? Just a, oh, yeah. Michael, yeah. Still, right? Oh, guys, just just a quick quick reminder. I don't want to keep teasing the audience, but the three of you have to stick around after we end the podcast so I can tell you the story because it's... Uh, oh, what we should take? It's picante, yeah. <laughs> Which is Italian for real good. Like, no. Uh, um, no, it's, it's, that means spicy, Mike. Nice try. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, I'm not gonna. You guys kind of summed up the last dance stuff real well, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that alone. Um, in terms of our ask question segment, uh, we got a question two weeks ago, which I want to get to. Um, but it's kind of lost his luster a little bit in the sense that, like, it's not really as much of a big news story. Who would be a better president? Um, oh, by the way, this comes from uh, Danny, not Coach Danny uh, Beauclair, but you know. No, a listener, Danny, who says who would be a Sam better president? Mark Cuban. Sorry, go ahead. Shout out to Samoan Danny with the skinny legs and the big yeah, head. Samoan Danny. It was Samoan Danny. Um, okay, I'll ask the question. Who would be a better president, Mark Cuban or Dana White? Um, real quick, guys. Who's your pick and why? Um, so it's it's hard to say because I feel like Mark Cuban knows a lot about running a multi-million dollar business, multi-billion dollar business. And he can, you know, he'd be phenomenal at maybe scaling the UFC. He'd be great for publicity and possibly bringing it into the mainstream. As far as the UFC can be brought into the mainstream, that's another debate to be had. Um, I feel like running mix, a mixed martial arts promotion, however, uh, and the day-to-day -day side of it, um, it involves a very specific set of skills and you need to be uh, intimately familiar with 
uh, the business itself. So I feel like there are certain skills Mark Cuban could bring to the table, not near necessarily on the, the management of the business itself, but more on scaling and, you know, bringing good publicity to the, to the UFC and, you know, signing good deals with other company and having good companies, having good promotion on that side of things. So I really think you would bring an interesting set of skills to managing the UFC. Sorry, what was the question? Was it who would be a better UFC president? No, it's just who would be a better president. It sounded to me like president of the United States. Oh, of the United States? Yeah, I was like, like, yeah. Oh, Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Dana White White would be a redder Donald Donald Trump. Yeah. (laughs) Slightly more coherent, but. Yeah, no, I I, I believe it was just simply who would be a better president. Um, so I believe he's talking about U.S. president. So let's, let's be honest; they both make terrible presidents. But no, you know what? I legitimately think Mark Cuban could do a l- good job, actually. Oh yeah, he, he he definitely would do a good job he, because he would listen to the people around him. I think. Yeah, he'd listen to the billionaires around him and give them a bunch of tax breaks. But universal health care, we'll push that to the side. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Like, am I, like I wrong? Cuban. I like Dana White. Mark Cuban would definitely be more of a populist. Dana White would be more of an authoritarian and dict- uh Almost, I want to say, and this is kind of related to that question that didn't quite make the show, but he would be a better president of some other um, Southeast Asian um, nations. Um, maybe bordering South Korea, for example. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I reportedly they are looking for one. So. <laughs> oh, I, 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 well, I, well, the way I'm not gonna get into that. <laughs> Shout out to my man, but I, I think he's like an effective leader. And once again, it just shows the types of effective leaders. Uh, mm-hmm. Mark Cuban is an effective leader, and definitely, in my opinion, and I hate this alpha argument, but. Uh, prime example of a, like a business alpha but so is dana white you know what i mean like and they're two yeah, completely yeah. different guys I, I i gotta be honest i feel like a lot of people don't realize that politics and business are two very different fields and they're a different set set of negotiations entirely and i think this disaster with donald trump has kind of you know uh, been been a, a a nice a nice lesson in that but what do you guys think no, I think Mark Cuban could legitimately do a good job. Like, I, you know, you, say what you will about Ronald Reagan, what he did for the American people or not did for the American people. But, you know, for a guy who's an actor, you know, he got some things done. So uh, I think Mark you mean Cuban. trickle can, down economics? Yeah, sorry, Mike. Stay in your lane, bro. No, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. What are you talking about, buddy? If, I'm, if, not if, saying, Mike, I'm not saying if, 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 I'm not saying he was good. I'm not saying he was good. Give me a second, guys. Give, I did not say he was good. I did not say he was bad. What I'm saying is that like he understood. David, I got you, man. <laughs> I, he understood what he was doing. You get what I'm saying? So like, uh, I'm yeah, just, oh, like, no, yeah. Trying to. Sorry, what I'm saying is trying to uh, trying to say that like Mark Cuban would do a bad job just because he's not a pol- uh, like a lifelong politician. I okay. don't think it's very. Well, like, Mike, Mike, Mike. First of all, there's there's two big differences here. One, Ronald Reagan had prior political experience. It's not like a Donald Trump situation where he was just thrown into the presidency. He was a governor of California. Number one. Number two, he was disastrous. He started. Um, scores of wars in south america this um, is, this is ruined true. ruined the american reputation abroad with his heavy-handed politics put a bunch of dictator right-wing dictators uh installed them all across the world and then he ruined the american economy this is, this is true they're all true it. so well, i mean <laughs> if you want to say he got stuff done as in he did a bunch of bad stuff yeah that's a great argument phenomenal Okay, I guess the point I was trying to make. Let's stay away you know, from not, politics. Yeah, let's, why are we doing politics? Danny, Danny. <laughs> oh, it was a question. On. Come was on, Danny. What are you no, doing to the like? Okay, but do you understand the point I'm trying to make is like you don't no. have to be a lifelong politician to necessarily do a bad job, as right? The, Just because as the president. Right? Yeah. Maybe yeah. one. Maybe one. One effect. Not. Not. This, this isn't necessarily a good argument. But name me one effective president who didn't have experience na- navigating politics. So interestingly enough, have you guys watched that Ukrainian show? Um, 
where or heard that story about yes. uh, how all the Ukrainian <laughs> actors <laughs> the Ukrainian. The Ukrainian press. Exactly. It was, a, it was a show about a Ukrainian actor who was making fun of politics and ended up becoming president, who then the lead actually, character of that show actually became president. It was hilarious. It's, yeah. If you want to. Yeah. You, yeah. Ta- speaking of failed states. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you like half Ukrainian, too? That I, am half Ukrainian. Ukrainian. I am yeah, half Ukrainian. I am half Ukrainian. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's a disaster. Plus, I mean, we don't want to get too political, but no. I mean. The United States did sign, and the European Union did sign a treaty guaranteeing Ukraine sovereignty. So, you know, Slav Ukraine. <laughs> right. I'm not saying I'm not saying Ronald Reagan was good or even bad for the American economy. I'm just saying he oh, wasn't a strong politician. Mike, you're, uh, you're you're you're, you're I, we get it. I'm saying. You're one of those. You're one of those black conservative guys, like that uh, that doctor who ran for president against Donald Trump. We, we get oh, it. What's his uh, name? Ben Carson. Yeah, Carson. you're the Ben Carson of the show. <laughs> <laughs> understandable, understandable. I, you've been exposed, my friend. I love where Michael is Ben Carson. Is there? Is there? Is there? Oh, a, wow. A, my heart. There's. <laughs> You just you just know there's some kind of effigy to Ronald Reagan sitting in his uh sitting <laughs> sitting in his closet that he worships every night. Like, How do you know? No, I'm kidding. Can can we move on to the next question or? No, that's that's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. There are no other like, questions. No other questions. Um, Let's we're two hours audience. in. So step, I, step hours in. Game up. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'll put out another thing next week. If you want to add a question, just I guess you know. This question came from the uh, Instagram page. So if you want to add a question, I guess you could also go to the Instagram page. But remember the email. Like, put it on somewhere we can document so I don't forget it. Because I think there was a couple other questions where people asked and I'm forgetting. I'm drawing a blank right now. So, you know, put it on, like, some sort of document. You know, email, Instagram, something. And then we'll get to it. Pigeon mail. If you want to pigeon send a, pig, a pigeon along to my address, phenomenal. Um, I will. What's that? Smoke signals. Smoke signals, excellent. Yeah. If you've got any flares, shoot them off. We'll we'll be able to see them from uh, our vantage points here in MMA heaven. I'm partial to the talking drum, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, guys, send in your questions, please. We'd love to read them. Cool, cool, cool. All right, with that, stop. No, do your thing. Hype up the podcast. Come on. Oh, you don't, you don't, you don't have a, you don't have a story this week, Mike. Or you wanna, uh, you wanna wrap it up and. No, I'll, I'll, I'll save it. It's we're two hours in. It's fine. Okay, guys. Um, I'm gonna keep this short and sweet. <sighs> subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Um, if you enjoy this podcast. <laughs> Mike, come on, you're killing me. Yeah, come on, man. I'm trying to all do a right, thing. All right, all right, go ahead, go ahead. Jesus, Ben Carson over here, man. Yeah, come on. Really. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't make fun of your failed presidential run. I, you know. Man. Tis, Poor tis, Ben tis. Carson. Poor Ben Did, Carson. Have you, by the way, have you, you guys ever seen the clip? It's the most embarrassing thing ever on the debate stage in uh, 2016 when Ben Carson, they're calling um, everybody out to the stage, and Ben Carson just stops in the middle of the hallway to walk out onto the stage. Donald Trump comes next and he's like stops there and they're just kind of awkwardly standing there in the middle of the hallway as people walk by them to go to the debate stage. <laughs> oh my god. If you haven't seen this clip, it's the it's 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 coma inducing cringe. But it's, um guys, it's if you enjoy respected surgeon. I just want to put that out there. Black yeah. excellence, but that's fine. <laughs> he's he's also proof that just because you're very good at one thing does not mean you're any good at anything else. <laughs> good point. He's, he, he, he's somehow an, an you know a highly respected brain surgeon who doesn't believe in evolution. So you you figure that one out for me. Yeah, uh, he split Siamese twins. I, I just yeah. Conjoined at conjoined at the brain. Well, conjoined, conjoined, at the brain. conjoined, not Siamese. Forgive me. Forgive me. Wow, was that a racist? I know. I know. Just made? I know. Know, David, was, sexist, was, racist. Was, all, right, all right, okay, all right. Okay, so, come on. Keep, guys, keep, keep, if you enjoy on, the podcast, this, if you enjoy the podcast, the podcast, if you enjoy the podcast, tell a friend about it, right? Uh, there's no better way to listen to the leg kick than to have other people that enjoy listening to the leg kick that you can discuss it with. So, um, 
talk to your friends about the leg kick. We're, we're always covering the latest news here. We're always breaking down the sport in a way that helps you understand it. The least you can do, you ungrateful pigs, is to, <laughs> <laughs> is to subscribe and like us and tell your friends about it. And maybe then when we take over the MMA world, we'll show you the slightest bit of mercy. Thank you very much. That's all I have for this week. <laughs> if anybody uh, ever doubted why we needed some cream in the pot in the coffee geez. cream in the coffee david we'll talk out we'll talk off <laughs> okay <laughs> michael please take us home take us home take us home all right um in in the world where stefano runs wild um and he you know, is the reason why coronavirus exists because God is punishing us for having him on the podcast. Just remember that you have three things. You have your life, you have your family, and you have this podcast. Good night, everybody. All right, and about Misha Tate, here's what happened. <laughs>